Uh, good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to consider the Scottish Fiscal Commission's economic and fiscal forecasts published last week to accompany the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy. And I welcome to the meeting for that purpose Dame Susan Rice, who is the Chair of the Commission, obviously, David Wilson, the Commissioner, Professor Alistair Smith, the, uh, also a Commissioner, and John Ireland, who is the Chief Executive of the F Commission. So I very warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting. And I invite Dame Susan Rice, if she wishes, to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to all of you, and thank you for asking us back. Uh, last Thursday, we published our second report containing our economic and fiscal forecasts for the next five years. You might hear other numbers this morning, but five is the number to remember, because this report is five pages shorter than the last report. But for the absence of all doubt, uh, I'm not about to forecast a trend in the size of our reports. Um, but with this report, we mark another milestone as it's our first summer report, all part of the new budget process. Our winter forecast, as you know, will be used by the government in preparing its budget, and our summer forecast can be taken as the first step in looking forward to the next year's budget, but it does not in itself affect the current year's budget. So winter and summer forecasts, two new terms to remember alongside the number five. We'll also continue to publish our forecast evaluation report every September, and we anticipate the upcoming report this year will be especially interesting as HMRC will publish their first full estimates of outturn income tax liabilities for Scotland over the summer, and we'll obviously be analyzing that and incorporating that into our September report. <coughs> Excuse me. Turning to the current report, which lays out the central forecast for use by the government, all the forecast tables and charts in spreadsheet form are posted on our website, which means all of you in your spare time can go in and uh, play with them if you'd like. Um, let me highlight now just a few headlines from the report. Last December, we described the outlook for growth as subdued. Our view now um, uh, of the overall outlook is broadly unchanged from December. The economy is growing, but the rate of economic growth has been slower over the last decade than historic average rates. Our view remains that this pattern of slower growth is likely to persist over the next five years. Nevertheless, unemployment is expected to remain low, with employment continuing to increase over the same period. Since our previous forecasts, we've done further analysis of wage growth in Scotland. Real wage growth has been weak over recent years. Real wages lower now than they were a decade ago. As a result of this new, new analysis, we've revised down our outlook for real wage growth in Scotland. Um, we anticipate it to fall by half a percent this year before gradually leveling off in 2019 and then starting to grow very slowly from 2020 onwards. Um, in line with this revision to the outlook for wages, our income tax forecast has also been revised down from the previous forecast by £209 million in 1819. That's about 1.7% of total liabilities. Um, and do keep in mind that's against uh, uh, tax intake of, of about £12 billion uh, for income tax. This report also contains detailed forecasts for tax receipts and devolved social security spending, including our first costing of the Scottish Government's planned expansions in Social Security, so the Carers Allowance Supplement, now planned to increase in line with inflation, will cost £46 million by 23-24. At the time when the Scottish Government provides further details on other benefits to be devolved and expanded, we will cost those. Uh, we've also been supporting the Scottish Parliament in its scrutiny of Scottish Government tax changes. Most recently, we published a costing of the change to group relief at the same time as the secondary legislation will continue to operate in that way. Finally, the Commission is also required to assess the reasonableness of the Government's borrowing plans on the basis of the information the Government provided us, together with their projections. The plans are within the limits set out in the fiscal framework. We do, however, note in our report that the government can only continue to borrow at the rate that it has done until 2022-23. Thereafter, the aggregate cap of £3 billion will be reached and will limit future borrowing. So those are our headlines, and we're now very happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much for, for, for the opening statement. And, and, and obviously, we'll need to put some stuff on the record. We, we've seen what you've said in your, your the, the, the narrative substance of the reports, but your income tax uh, forecast is now £209 million lower than it was in 2018-19 than 
for 2018-19 than it was in December. Um, that's only four months ago. So what's changed? Excuse me. <clears throat> um, what's changed is that uh, for the December report, we spent a lot of time uh, analyzing uh, productivity, which is one of the big factors which influences the um, the. Uh, economic forecast. Uh, since then, we've uh, done a lot of analysis on wage growth, and I mentioned uh, some of the uh, Im the understanding from that analysis, which is that wage growth is really quite low. When that affects the overall economic forecast, that necessarily feeds into the income tax forecast, because if there are lower earnings, there's less tax paid. It's a very simple way of saying it. So could we try and get a bit underneath about that analysis and what data drove the, the, some of the outcomes and some of the judgments so we can understand a bit more clearly about why there's that lower projection on, on wage growth? Yeah. Does somebody want to pick up the detail on the, on the data, John or Alistair? Yeah, go ahead. There, there are two main elements to it. One is we have done further analysis of, of wage growth within the, the macroeconomic forecast, uh, reflecting and reflecting the fact that wage growth has been low for the since 2008, and lower than one might expect given the, we, we, in our last report, we put a lot of effort into discussing productivity. As we've looked further at real wage growth, we've observed that real wage growth has been low, even relative to what one might expect in relation to productivity. So uh, the, the overall picture over the last 10 years is of very low wage growth, and we've taken that more fully into account in this forecast than we had done previously. Uh, the second major element is that in the last year, uh, real wage growth has been particularly low, negative indeed. So for the next couple of years, that's, that's our starting point. So those are the two uh, elements of further analysis and recent data, both pushes in the direction of uh, expecting real wage growth to be lower than we had in the previous forecast. Not, as Susan said, by a huge amount, but sufficient to have this 1.7% effect on the income tax forecast. I remember when, when you came in front of the committee in December, or just after December report, the committee were asking questions at that stage around the wage growth issue, because you had projected um, better wage growth in Scotland compared with the rest of the UK, and therefore that, in terms of the overall impact left Scotland in almost the same position as the rest of the UK in terms of tax take. Um, but I still haven't got a feel yet for what changed between December and now in terms of the data you were looking at. What, what, and what, sort of, what, 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 what was that analysis so we can understand a bit more clearly about exactly what was going on? Because obviously this is, although it's only £209 million, as you described, one out of 12 billion, it's still 209 million potentially in the longer term of, of public expenditure in Scotland. Could I perhaps add a little bit of detail around that then? Um, one of the issues that we face with, with wages in Scotland is, is, is data availability that um, there's no sort of headline series for, for, for real wages, so we have to sort of use a number of different sources. Um, if you look at the main report on figure 2.3, you can see um, what we've done is, is, is plotted some of that data for Scotland, the two measures available for Scotland and, and similar measures for the UK. So um, first of all, it, it's a matter of interpreting sort of two or three different sources of, of, of wage data. Um, we, we've done that. Um, we've also um, had some new data, um, an additional data point, um, so we've taken that into account. But the main, the main sort of thing which is driving this analysis is that we spent some time looking at how real wages have moved in relation to um, you know, the standard things which drive um, real wages in sort of economic theory are productivity um, and also labour market slack. So we've done some work looking at how real, real wages respond to sort of labour market slack or the extent of unemployment. Um, and to productivity changes, and also thought about sort of, you know, are there any other breaks on the sort of evolution of real wages? Um, and we've done some sort of work which sort of tries to sort of give us a sense of that, and that allowed us to sort of reconsider um, our forecast. Um, and if you look again at the main report, um, you can sort of see there's a figure which tries to sort of, sort of capture that figure 2.5. The 
just, I'm just looking at that just now. Sorry, uh, uh, Murdo, you want to just go on from this stage? Till I just put that. Yeah, on sure. Um, I'll, I'll come back. I mean, what, what I'd like to understand really is, is around this issue around wage growth. You, you said back in December you expected wage growth would match the rest of the UK. I've now revised that view because you're now accepting that GDP per capita and productivity will grow in Scotland more slowly than the rest of the UK. It just, it just seems quite a, a radical change to make in quite a short space of time. I'm just wondering if you could explain a bit more about your reasons for that. I think the simplest way to say it is that we have analysed further um, the information to hand and have made judgments in, in terms of what that uh, what that means. Um, I mean that that's why a, a, a change comes about because we have more information, more evidence that we've put into the forecast. Uh, no, I, I, okay, I understand that, but the, the, the consequence of this is because of this revision downwards. Combined with a, a revisions in the OBR figures, which affect the block grant adjustment, means that for the current financial year, the Scottish Government's budget is facing a, a black hole of nearly £390 million, pounds, which is you know, a substantial chunk of money. Now, we know it doesn't have to be met in this financial year because we know there is the opportunity to defer that until the final figures are available. But nevertheless, it's a real challenge for the Finance Secretary, who we'll be hearing from very shortly. So. Um, I mean, do you have any reflections on <laughs> on this process and uh, what this is going to mean in the future in terms of forecasting and its impact upon budget decisions if if in such a short space of time such a large differential can appear? A, an an overall statement, and I'll ask David to give you more detail, but this is in the nature of forecasting that um, there are changes that come up and down, and we see that with the OBR forecasts. If you go back, and, and it will happen with ours as well. David... Do you want to amplify yeah. that? Yeah. Absolutely. I'd just build on what, what Susan said. I think in terms of the last OBR forecast, I think they amended their income tax forecasts by the order of about 2%. Ours was 1.7%. So in, in in most contexts, a revision of forecasts of the order of 1%, 2%, 3% wouldn't appear to be a, a, a major or a significant issue in the context, in the Scottish context, when you're dealing with income tax of the order of £12 billion, then inevitably a revision has a significant headline number, and we, we, we fully acknowledge that. So I, I think that, just responding more directly to your, to your questions, I think, um, firstly, we, we do recognise that we have adjusted downwards, made a, a downwards revision to our income tax forecast, which I think, as my colleagues have said, have very much reflects the further analysis that we've been able to do and our further understanding of the full implications of our wider economic assessments and the, the GDP forecast that we have been made and what that will mean in more detail in terms of income tax forecast. So further analysis, further data um, and an improved assessment on our part has led to this, this downgrade. I think in terms of the specific issues about the, the, the budget, then in you know, just to, to recognise and maybe just to clarify the nature of our forecast and the nature of the medium-term financial strategy. I mean, this is very much the, the first stage of the setting for um, what, what will be ne you know, next year's budget. So these forecasts in themselves don't uh, affect the, the funding that uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will have, a, ha have available you know, du during the year, and the actual setting of budgets will be based on our next forecasts um, in, in December. So we fully acknowledge we've downgraded the assessment. Um, we have taken into account better information in doing that. We think it's a more um, accurate as, and, and, and f fuller assessment. But in terms of the uh, uh, having to find additional money or adjust the budget, that would not be the case because these are initial the initial process of the the new budget arrangements no i, I understand that mr wilson completely okay. but 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 if your forecasts are correct it will mean that when the outturn figures come out there will be a reduction in the amount of money of around 400 million pounds which is you know a, a chunky sum of money even in the context of the scottish budget which either this finance secretary or a future finance secretary is going to have the job of trying to uh, yeah. address I Yes, but I think it's worth emphasising that the outturn figures for we're talking about 2018-19 will not be available for two years. Uh, I'd be very surprised if there aren't further. For, we have to be realistic. 
there are going to be further forecast revisions between now and then. So it could get worse. Per <laughs> particularly uh, because we will, as Susan said in her introduction, have outturned have outturn figures for 2016, 17, 2017, 18 before then, which will feed into our forecasts. And if, just to pick up what you said, if it turns out in two years' time that the outturn is £200 million down as we have forecast, then I think you, should, you will then, I hope, congratulate us on being two years ahead of the game in alerting the government to the, the fact that, that the forecast is a bit more negative than we previously thought. James. Uh, thanks a lot, Convener. Uh, I, I'm still not totally clear on what has driven the change in the forecast uh, in relation to wages. Um, and it is quite a serious situation for the Cabinet Secretary to be in, although, as Mr Wilson points out, it doesn't change the budget allocations for this year. If these figures turned out to be accurate, a combination of the income tax change plus the OBR forecast mean, in effect, that the Cabinet Secretary is nearly £400 million down and where he started when he, when he allocated his budget. So I think it's important that we, you know, the, 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 the forecasts are... Uh, are, are robust. So, in terms of the wage growth, Table 2.5 uh, sets out four sources for which, for, for, from which you take uh, the calculation of wage data. Um, uh, and, and it's sourced that the, the, there are four, in effect, kind of different surveys. So, I wonder if it's possible to just talk through the changes in those sources which uh, have driven the, the changes in your assumptions around wage growth? Well, I suspect that's you. Yes. Um, I was just thinking. Um, so I think, I th I think you know, Table 2.5 sort of, you know, is, is particularly key here, and I think it illustrates the, the, the issue that we have a number of sources. We have um, four different sources of, of wage data, all of which are um, collected in different ways and have different strengths and weaknesses. And they produce you know, quite a divergent picture of um, wage growth. And in a sense, you could, you could be quite simplistic and you could sort of average those and, and come up with a number. Or in a sense, you can sort of make some sort of judgment. And what we've done is, is, is we've looked at the evolution of this data over um, a number of years. You know, the data goes back a long way. Um, some of the data goes back you know, to 2000 and, and prior to that. So in a sense, we, we, we've been able to have a look at these four data sources and how this has changed over a long period of time and also over a shorter period of time and come to a judgment about what we think is the underlying change in re real wages. And that, that sort of an analysis combined with our judgment has, has led to us to sort of having an understanding of, of the, what we think the evolution of real wages is. And then we've done some further work, as I was explaining earlier, which tries to sort of link that to conditions in the economy, to how much demand there is for labour and how much that's bidding up the price of labour or, or real wages, how much productivity increases are driving ch the change in real wages, and um, an extent to, wi to which um, other factors may be influencing real wages. So it, it's an awful lot of sort of analysis. Um, we have a lot of data and alternative data sources, and there's no definitive series here. It's not like GDP where you can point your finger and say, it's that one. You, know, you have to sort of um, look at all the sources and, and, and reach some sort of judgment. So that's, in essence, what we've done. And I'm still not clear what, what new data has emerged in the last four months. To so it's, it's, it's a combination of new data in the sense that we've had um, I think an, an observation, an extra observation, quarterly observation. Um, we have some, you know, these things come along in, in, at sort of dif different frequencies. So there is some new data, and that, that has helped inform our, what we think is going on. But the principal thing is that we, we have looked at sort of existing data in much more detail. So in a sense, what we've been doing here is we've been thinking about the sort of the key factor which drove, 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 drives the Scottish economy, productivity growth, and that's what we examined in December, and, and we spent a lot of time in the run-up to that December forecast looking at um, productivity growth. And now, in a sense, what we've done is we, we, we've changed our focus of where we put a lot of our efforts in between um, December and now is looking at the evolution of real growth. So it's a combination of new data and it's a combination of additional analysis. 
Right, let, let me ask it slightly differently. Um, of the four sources, uh, in terms of wage growth for 2017, it varies from LFS actually forecasting a reduction of 1.5% to the ASHE, uh, which forecast wage increases of 3.2% in 2017. Um, so there's quite a range there. Now, you say in your note that the primary source of data for you, and therefore I assume the priority that you give in terms of your modelling is the uh, ONES um, source, um, which had an increase of 0.8% in 2017. Now, that's much less than the, the top two, ASHE at 3.2% and RTI at 2%. Um, so you're given greater weighting to, if you like, a more pessimistic view uh, in relation to wages. So can you maybe just explain why that, that would be the case? So uh, there are two, if you, if you want to sort of use the sort of the optimistic pessimistic flag, and since there are two data sources there, the LFS one and the QNAS one, which is um, from um, the national accounts. Um, so, you know, and our judgment is that roughly, you know, real wages declined in 2017 by about one percentage point. So what we've done is we, 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 we've given more weight to the combination of LFS and QNAS in, in comparison to the other two. And that's because, in a sense, we, you know, that's where, you know, that's our sort of sense. It's a judgment that these are the sort of the data sources which are probably capturing what's going on better than the other two. But, but uh, if I can add one point just to reflect back on a reference which John made in an earlier answer. Uh, for me, the strongest number to focus on is what's, or the strongest statistic to focus on is what's shown in figure 2.3 in our report, which shows the pattern of real wages using several different measures, and the story there is that real wages now are lower than they were in 2009. This is an unprecedented, virtually unprecedented economic picture, and I think we should focus on that story of 10 years in which real wages have not increased, not even in line with productivity. That, it's the analysis of that that's really driving it rather than focusing on what's happened in, in one year statistics. What's happened in the one year has played some role, but it's the long run story about real wages that is the most important thing to focus on. Adam's got a supplementary. Yeah, but as, as Dame Susan said at the beginning in her opening remarks, this is new for all of us, um, this, and we're, we're still trying, as you can hear from the kind of tone and tenor of the, com of the questions, so far we're still trying slash struggling to understand the great science of economic forecasting and even whether it's a science at all. Um, and, and I'm not an economist, I'm a, I'm a simple lawyer, so can I ask a simple lawyer's question about what you've just been talking about with James Kelly and Murdo Fraser? What's, what we're interested in is what has changed since your last forecast. Um, is it the facts that have changed? Have you changed your mind about the existing facts? Or have you just realised that um, you spent an awful lot of time thinking about productivity last time round and not enough time thinking about wage growth, wage, wage growth last time round and you're just catching up? Which, which of those three is it? Have the facts changed? Have you changed your mind about the existing facts? Or is this just a, additional work which wasn't done last time? Um, I, think I hope that's not an unfair question. We just, as you can say, no, no, we're still no, trying, no. To, just un, trying to understand how this process of forecasting actually works. It's a good lawyer's question. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, as John said, we've had a few more data points. Not a lot, but we've had some more. They didn't serve to change the the perspective. So that's one aspect. But when you talk about the science of forecasting, forecasting is part science, and I like to use the word imagination, because it is part judgment. Um, and we are making a judgment at a particular point in time. So since the last time you had forecasts from us, we've seen what the OBR came out with in the middle of March. Um, and part of what they say uh, impacts part of our judgment and our forecast. So, you know, that's new data in a more general sense. Um, and we're looking at no change change in the rather sort of uncomfortable numbers about wage growth. Um, any new pieces of data about Scottish wage growth have not gone in, in a positive direction. So it's a combination of those things. Uh, it's, not just, it's not just one thing. And it's not that um, we missed some data that, that were out there that we forgot about or anything like that. It's not that. Um, but we felt that it was worth, and partly you showed interest in real wages 
back in December, we're very interested as well, and we thought it was worth doing um, deeper and fuller analysis, and um, that analysis uh, was done by our colleagues in the Commission, discussed at length with us as Commissioners, and the judgment is what we've come out with. Patrick, have we got there, or you want to still ask a question in this area? Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'd just like to ask a, a little bit more about what you think is going on underneath the, the overall level of wage growth that you're forecasting. Um, in particular, you've um, identified some factors that suggest that while we'll see very low wage growth for the next few years, it will rise again from 1920, uh, sorry, 2019-20 onwards, um, including, uh, for example, higher sector pay awards, uh, increasing levels of productivity. You're saying that these kind of factors will lead to, to stronger wage growth after that point or, or from then onwards. What's the, what's the reason for assuming that those factors will start to kick in at that point? Uh, I'm looking at page 57 in the, yeah. the full report. I think briefly to go into this, we're, we're very conscious, and I think perhaps going back to um, the er earlier comments, we're, we're learning as we go in terms of fuller and, and better understanding. Um, alongside what is a changing situation. And we're very conscious that the um, what happened in 2015-16, which is coming through in, in, in the data, is one thing. Trying to interpret what is currently going on um, is, is perhaps another. But the absolute core part of our forecasts um, is that the period of low real wage growth, the period of subdued uh, GDP, um, which we've seen really since the financial crash, is continuing longer than anyone reasonably expected and is expected to continue for a few years yet. But at the core of our, our forecasts is that um, once we get into towards the, the, the second half of the five-year period we forecast, we are forecasting a uh, um, increase in productivity. Um, in fact, in terms of looking at some of the numbers, uh, you know, inside our assessments, there's actually quite a sharp um, increase in productivity compared to what we've seen over the last few years, and that will lead through to um, that will lead through to real wage growth and others. I think on on why, um, you know, uh, I think <clears throat> most people um, are are coming to terms with the fact that um, economic growth has been disappointing for at least 10, 10 years, um, and we're not getting back to the sorts of rates of growth that we saw before the financial crash. Fundamentally, I think everybody uh, you know, who is in the business of forecasting thinks that it must get better than it has been. The debate is about the time and the extent to which, it will, you know, whether and over what time period we'll get back to earlier rates of growth. Our assessment is perhaps a, a you know, middling one in the latter of the year. What is happening in the economy in terms of um, whether it's artificial intelligence, digital uh, you know, changes, further you know, boosts and significant act, um, productivity improvements in, in manufacturing. There's a, there's a whole range of positive developments that are going on in the economy, which are, which are in terms of the overall numbers, being hidden by the continuing you know, overhang of what, what happened to the, with the financial crash. And we do expect that to come through towards the latter half of the five-year period. And that is what's impacting on um, increased real wages and increased GDP that we see I, at the end I of the I haven't period. heard many people suggest that automation is a, is a factor that sh should make us optimistic about wage growth. Um, it, it, it may well. It, the distributional impact may well be. In fact, you know, those people that are working in terms of um, uh, creating both the, the algorithms and the you know, manufacturing of the, of the robots and, and other things, the, the, the distributional impact is a major issue. But in that, technological change will lead to overall improvements in productivity that will impact on, on real wage growth at some point, and that's what we expect to see. I hope the algorithms don't start making themselves. Uh, I did want to ask about distribution as well, though. There, there are some of these factors on, on the same page uh, that uh, you're, you're suggesting clearly impact more or less at the higher or lower end of the, of the income scale. And clearly, in order to... Uh, 
link the, uh, the, the wage growth projections into income tax projections, you're going to have to have a, a fairly clear sense of what you think the distribution of incomes is going to be. Are you able to say any more about that and can you publish any more information that can allow us to generate some kind of projections about the, the impact of this on income inequality in Scotland? Formally, at present, we don't have a, a particular plan to publish a, a full assessment of the distributional implications of our um, within our forecasts, which um, I think potentially would be a possibility. We have to take it into account because it's a material factor in, in affecting our, our forecast. That's certainly something that we could consider drawing out in a, in a further publication. But there's no, we don't have a, a, a document in preparation at the moment, but that's certainly something we could consider. It's something you have to take in account, into account, then it, it does exist. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's a factor, one of the many factors that's in, implicit and partly explicit in the modelling work that, that we put together over a again, over the five-year period that we're, we're talking about, the extent to which there will be any substantial shift in both the distribution of, of income and certainly of earnings returns, you know, we wouldn't expect that to be a, a very major factor. Um, but that's something certainly we could do some further work on and we could share that with the committee. Thank you. Just still on this uh, issue of the wage growth forecast, if you, you don't mind, please. Are you saying that... Um, the downgrade in your forecast is mainly because of the LFS downgrade in its forecast. Is that why you've... Because you said you placed greater weight in that, I think, Mr Ireland. No, I, I, I said that we looked at all those four measures in that table um, and the one that we put great... The two that we put greater weight on were, were the LFS and QNAS. So there's the, those two figures. But um, it, 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 it's much more a, a judgment of how all four have moved and moved over time. But with respect to the LFS forecast, I'm looking at the data that might be responsible for this downgrade. Uh, the ONS table shows there's a little bit of volatility in the Scottish figures over the last year, but the ONS um, themselves say that the LS, LFS forecast is perhaps the least reliable of all of these forecasts. They refer to the data that comes to LFS being self-reported by employees and not employers, so it makes it a little bit less reliable. Plus, LFS data can be supplied by proxy and not by employers or employees at all. So they, the ONS themselves say that LFS is a, probably less reliable than the others. So does that not call into question your your judgment about using that as a major reason for doing one of the major reasons no, but for doing your forecast? I think what I've been trying to be clear about is that we, we look at all four of these because each of those surveys has different strengths and weaknesses, and you've identified one of the weaknesses of, LF, of LFS. But you know, there are the strengths relating to sample size and things like that. Um, and you, if you look at all four of those series, they all have strengths and weaknesses. So it becomes a, a, a matter of, of sort of looking at the evolution of all four of them. The other thing which is really important here, it's not about one figure. It's not about one quarter's figure. It's about how these have moved over time, which is why you know, earlier in the Earlier in the, um, yeah, there's another table, um, sorry, another figure, figure 2.3, which actually looks at the evolution over time and how they move together and how they move differently. So it, what we've done is we've, we've looked at a very long data series here, um, not just one observation, and we've looked at how all four of those have moved and how they move together and how they move differently. Um, and that's how we've reached our judgment. It, it, it's a matter of trying to use the data, which is imperfect, and each of these four sources has strengths and weaknesses, and try and balance those things out. It just so happens that you know, for the particular quarter that we were, we, sorry, year that we were talking about, you know, it has that ranking. But you know, it would be incorrect to sort of say that you know, um, it's a quarter, it's a simple one quarter thing or a, or a one year thing. It's, it's much about the evolution of all four series over time. Good. No. There was a couple of people who said they wanted to potentially ask supplementaries. And, 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 Ivan, you wanted to ask something in this yeah, area please, as well? Yeah. And I know Neil was, I'm not sure, are we, are we, are we, I thought we might be exhausted in this area, but obviously we're not, Ivan. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, convener, and thanks, uh, panel, for going through this with us. I just want to clarify a few things that have come out in the discussion. Um, we're looking at table 2.5, figure 2.3, um, we're looking at the data sets that are there. Now, just to be clear, the data that's in there um, is what those organisations thought the outturn was, not the forecast, because we're talking about 2016 and 2017. Yeah. 
Sorry. In terms of wage growth percentages, you've got the table with the different organisations under different percentages for organisations. Oh, you mean Sorry. survey? Yes, it is actual. Yes. Yes. Table 2.5 yes. is actual yes. data, yes. yes. Correct, yeah. yeah. So that's actual data, because I think there's going to be some confusion here about the yeah. forecast. Yeah. So, that's, so even when you look at that, um, there are four surveys there um, talking about what they think has actually happened in the past, not what they think is going to happen in the future. And even at that, the variation between what they think has actually happened is actually bigger between the biggest and the smallest than the variation in your the one point seven percent you're talking about in your forecast accuracy. So even when you're looking at that and saying what has actually happened in the past, we still don't know what's actually happened looking backwards, never mind looking forwards. But, but it is important to notice that the, the surveys are not looking at the same variable. So the, P, the RTI C is looking at average annual earnings, ASH is looking at gross hourly pay, LFS is looking at gross weekly earnings, full time workers only. Each sure. each of them is different. It's no, not understand that, that. It's yeah. not that they're giving four different answers to the same question. No, I understand that. that. Yeah. But notwithstanding that, wage growth is not is only something we're measuring as a proxy because what we really want to know is what the impact on income tax receipts are, because that's what goes in the budget. Wage growth doesn't go in the budget. Income tax receipts go in the budget. But the only reason for measuring wage growth is so as we can figure out what income tax receipts are going to be. Yeah. Yes, and that, that's one of the factors that impacts the income tax forecast. Yeah, yes. correct. Yeah. As I okay. said before, less earned, less tax paid. Okay, yeah. so notwithstanding the fact they're all measuring something different, you've still got to figure out the relationship between what they're measuring, which are all different, and they're giving you a wide range of different numbers and what's going to happen in the future. So the point I'm making is that given that lack of stability and what has actually happened in the past, it's kind of not surprising that your forecast accuracy is going to have up to 1.7% variation in it. It's. I, I think it's even more complicated than that. Yes, I think, I think what you <laughs> because you're in you know, unprecedented times as well, so you can't even rely no, it, on. It, so on the other data that that, in the past. So it really goes to, in a sense, and um, the data that we have on income tax and income tax payers. So we have another data source, mm -hmm. the, um, and this is the, the, the tax, re tax records of individual taxpayers, and this is a survey of personal incomes, and this is the data which lies behind our income tax forecast. So we have a lot of data on, on individual people. Mm -hmm. um, it's much less timely, so the data we have is much older, and that's what we sort of use to generate our income tax forecast. This data about we real wage growth is then sort of um, used to update um, that sort of rather old data, um, very, very detailed data, and that allows us to sort of have a sense of where income tax is now, and then our forecasts of, of, of wage growth then sort of are used to project forward that very detailed micro data, individual data, mm -hmm. into the future. So there are a number of sort of steps in this process. Um, I think the, the sort of, what I take as a sort of, um, that gives me a sort of a, a more a degree of greater confidence is that we have individual taxpayer individual taxpayer data and um, dated though it be and and that allows us to sort of get a much better and richer understanding of sort of income tax receipts and uh, that relates to some of the the um, questions mr harvey was asking earlier about sort of distributional effects as well um, the, the the point of this data on, on wage growth is basically how you project that sort of individual data forward so given we're struggling to know what happened in the past it's not surprising that you're struggling to tell us what's yes. going to happen in the future. And that, 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 that is the, <clears throat> yeah. you want the science or the art yeah. or the um, dark arts even mm -hmm. of, of forecasting. Yes. And if you look at the stack tolerances, they are even more difficult because there's a number of different factors involved yeah. um, as well. Okay, right, that's clear. So given we're, go we're going to have unpredictability, um, the question then is how you deal with that. Now, we talked about, um, you said 1.7% is not unusual when we're talking about forecasting errors, and you talked about the OBR, I think, had a 2% error in the current time period. Now, is there something fundamentally different there? Are they just, uh, you look at a UK level, are they just used to having to deal with that so they kind of just manage it better? Um, or do they have extra powers um, and the ability to deal with those shocks and those forecast issues compared to what's available to the Scottish Government? Let me just say their 2% was 2% up and ours was 1.7% 1%, 1 down. They may be down that, yeah. the next time. So, but that's, not, I mean, that's yeah. not the issue. The, important, yeah. the issue is you're going to get that variability and sometimes yeah. it'll yeah. up and sometimes it'll be down. Yeah. It's how you deal with it. Um, happy to... <laughs> Okay. Okay. We're all, we're all, we're all Everyone wants to David, speak. David, David. David John <laughs> Alistair. Right, shall I go first? Uh, I think... Um, 
I, I think very briefly, clearly at the UK level, there's much greater you know experience um, and um, of you know undertaking budgets, managing you know varying income, varying expenditure. The fiscal framework in Scotland is relatively newer, and we're all learning as part of this process. And I. I'm personally grateful for your acknowledgement that this is a difficult, a difficult task, but it's the task that you know, the fiscal commission was, was, was set up to do. And to understand what, what perhaps is clear, if, if, if I may, if it's not uh, inappropriate to, to quote the, the, um, the government's numbers rather than ours, but in the MTFS, it's very clear if you look at, in terms of the, the uncertainty that they model in terms of income tax, um, um, potential highs and lows income tax, our. Our central estimate is, is used in that document, but they estimate somewhat high and low. And you know, the, um, you know, the, they quote that net spending power could be between minus 400 million or plus 1.4 billion, you know, below and above our, our central estimate. That's the range of so uncertainties that? that that's in the MTFS. That's our oh, right, NXP, that's, yeah, okay, uh, sorry, government's yeah, figures. Okay. But just there is a significant mm -hmm. range of mm -hmm. potential income. Our role is to seek to give the best current estimate of, of how that, that will go forward, and that's what we're very much trying to do. John, unless you want to just add to that, or is that the same? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose the question was... Move on a bit. Right. Let others, let's make this your last one. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 I suppose the question was, is the UK government, because they have got more powers, they've got a wider tax base, they've got different taxes coming in, they've got more economic levers, are they better able... They've got more borrowing powers, are they better able to deal with those natural forecast variations in the Scottish Government is with its limited scope of powers, limited scope of borrowed powers to, be able to deal with that? Well, the, the, I think the short answer to that is the, the fiscal framework for the UK Government is different for a whole number of reasons, uh, from Scotland borrowing powers is one, um, the fact that, that, um, that, there are, that if there are forecast errors in relation to Scotland, the reconciliation is two or three years ahead rather than uh, coming along, along at once. It's, it, is a, it is a very different framework, uh, and, and the ability of the different governments to adjust to changes in income tax is different as a result. Okay. Are you still wanting this, Neil? Yeah, just, uh, very brief. If, if, if we're saying that hourly earnings are slowing, but there's still strong growth in terms of um, hours worked, what does that say about living standards? Um, does that, can we assume that there's been a relative reduction in living standards? Um, it, we've made the statement that real wages are uh, lower than they were a decade ago, and real wages are, when you strip out inflation, what you have left to spend. So I think you can draw the conclusion from that. Um, but the, there is a, a partial upside, which is that we have employment that's very strong, unemployment that's decreasing, and in fact employment is growing. So uh, that means that for those people willing and capable and able to work, there seem to be jobs uh, out there. It is conceivable that um, if employment is even fuller, that uh, some of the jobs may may earn that, that wages may rise because there's there's pressure there but the the downside of having <coughs> high employment and and low, lowering unemployment is something around capacity because if we saw a lot of investment happening and the need for other new jobs which would then ultimately improve wage growth um we need the people to take those jobs okay listen um it's not related directly to wages but in paragraph 24 of your summary it talks about real household disposable income. Um, and in, in the early years of the forecast, that's obviously a challenge. And obviously, Mark Kearney, the Governor of the Bank of England, a couple of weeks ago, suggested that as a result of the vote on Brexit, household incomes were already uh, £900 less than they previously had been. Um, in these circumstances, did you, is, has, there any been any, has there been any building into, I don't, I don't want to make things worse and make it even more pessimistic, but has there been any building into this forecast of that sort of description of Mark Kearney about since the vote, not about Brexit itself, because we all know yet, we don't know what that final deal will look like, but since the, the Brexit vote, there's been a £900 per household reduction in spending power. And was that factored into your 
survey at this your, your material at this stage? So, um, in the economy forecast, uh, we look at Brexit as one of the background factors. Um, we make some general judgments, but we can only incorporate um, information when we have specific policy, when we have specific data to hand, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So, the, the real impact of Brexit is that there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and therefore it leads uh, possibly to um, less confidence in, in business investment and, and, and so on. We've not picked up a figure that uh, uh, the governor has stated um, and don't actually know the basis for that unless my colleagues do. Um, but Brexit is there as a, as a background factor um, that is, is creating a bit of drag on future investment. I wouldn't imagine the Bank of England <coughs> governor would have said that without some sort of analysis, though. I, I, I'm assuming there was some sort of analysis that the bank had done. David? Yeah. No, just because I, mean, that they, I think they... They do, and they have clearly a different role from ours. I mean, we we don't we haven't made an assessment, and I don't think we would make an assessment based on a, a sort of um, Brexit versus no Brexit sort of counterfactual. Almost, we we don't do those sort of calculations. But broadly speaking, in our our assessment, um, it might be worth you know, check on table two, which is on page forty two. That sets out our estimates, which come out of the modelling work we do of household consumption. Um, and like real wages, that shows very limited increases over the period of, of the forecast, um, which is exactly what you'd expect given um, given the overall assessment that there are you know, clearly pressures in terms of household consumption as well as as well as wages. Yeah, but I wasn't really mm. thinking about what's coming. His comments were made on what's already happened. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming okay. that there, therefore, come December, you'll be able to look at that area a bit more in depth when you make your next forecast? In the expectation that we will have a lot more information uh, about how Brexit is likely to unfold, our intention is to, to provide uh, okay. uh, that the December forecast will incorporate uh, a much fuller analysis of the effects of Brexit on the assumption that we have a clearer picture, that we will have a much clearer picture okay. then. OK. Right, I think we need to move on to uh, another area now. Ash, migration. Thank you, convener. Yes, yeah, so we've obviously spent quite a bit of time there talking about the impact of the public finances of wages. But I guess, from my perspective, underpinning that is obviously the working population and the proportion of working age population in economic terms is really important. And we know that it's not growing quite as fast in Scotland as it is in the rest of the UK. So in your report, you've said this places a drag on growth in GDP in Scotland. So I suppose uh, my assessment on that would be that it, it's difficult not to conclude then that it might be beneficial, at least in economic terms, for Scotland to control migration themselves. But I wouldn't expect you necessarily to comment on that. So in your report, um, for your calculations, you said that you use the 50% net EU migration variant of the ONS 2016-based population projections for Scotland, whereas the OBR has continued to use the principal projections for the UK. So can you explain for the committee um, what's the difference between those two and why you've used the one that you have? Um, if you, if, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think two things, what you say, I think first in terms of the population uh, projections that we use, we very much use the, um, the um, ONS and National Records for Scotland um, main projections, but they, produ they produce a variety of different um, variants of their projections and we we chose to use what, what they call the 50% uh, EU uh, version um, of those so they're not our forecasts we're just you, you, we, we choose one of the variants that, that they use I mean, in terms of a bit of background Scotland's population has not been growing as fast as as the rest of the UK I think in 2017 we tipped into a period where there was a natural decrease in in the population in the sense that you know there were uh, more deaths than, than than births in very uh, you know simple language so population is something that I think is 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 very important in terms of our forecast and Scotland has some some differences but the key factor that's been driving um, faster growth in in the UK and and, and less growth in, in Scotland is different levels of uh, in migration uh, and what we've we've seen we've gone um, over a time period from uh, you know and I checked back in the numbers back in 1997 there was a net outflow of about 7,000 <coughs> people um, uh, in 2006 there was a net inflow of about 30,000 so the, the, per, you know, in, in those each years. So we've gone now to very significant levels of, of uh, in-migration. And 
to you know, explain the, 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 the uh, specific forecast that we used. Um, in the forecast, the principal projection for Scotland, as forecast by uh, ONS and uh, NRS, assumes an average net in migration of 15,000 people based on the recent historical trends. Um, and that will go forward over the, the, the period of, of the projection. Um, given the Brexit vote and the possibility or um, that there will be change in behaviours and a tighter uh, my, um, immigration regime, um, what, what we, what the, the variance that they choose is, is that um, of that 15,000, um, only part of it is due to EU migration, and what the assumption is that that portion that is due to EU um, in migration and EU out migration is effectively halved. So there will be, uh, that, which is where the 50% comes from, um, uh, and so it's not no in migration or out migration from the EU, but it's it's a significant reduction in the um, in in the changes. And what that leads to is rather than a net in migration of 15,000 per annum, it reduces it to a net in migration of 9,000 per annum. Um, and that works through the, the numbers uh, going forward. Um, we, we felt that was a, a recognition of the downside risks in terms of Scotland's population of the, um, of the vote to, to leave the EU. And we made that. That was in our December forecast. And we've not changed our, our view on that in, in these forecasts. Um, it, may, it may be different for that, but that's the, the forecast that we, we use um, at the moment. And just to just add a, a little bit of information, you mentioned the so-called working age population, which we call 16 to 64, because people are working beyond that. Um, but those are the primary uh, income wage earners, and um, that is actually beginning to shrink. That population will start shrinking a little bit this year, and we see that shrinkage to continue um, a little ways in the future. So that also has uh, an overall impact. Uh, and our birth rate, of course, isn't enough to compensate for what happens at the other end. So various factors affecting population. Okay, thank you. Alexander? Uh, thank you, convener. I just note my register of interest around house building. Um, if I could just ask a question on LBTT. Um, yeah, there's been a modest increase in, in revenue from that, and there are a couple of anomalies uh, around that. Um, you know, one has been there's a, been a huge increase in sales, over 325,000. Uh, some, some attribute that to post the uh, UK general election. Uh, some commentators concluding that you know, there was increased confidence for some of a diminished prospect of India F2. Uh, there's another anomaly uh, in that you know, just four postcodes in Edinburgh uh, account for nearly 20% of all LBT receipts. Uh, uh, however, the overall trend has been that the number of transactions has, has uh, dropped, uh, you know, contrary to what your prediction is. Uh, so, so the question is really, uh, is you know, against a backdrop of you know, stagnating wages growth and uh, I think in, in figure 2.3, uh, the uh, you know, continuing fall in gross weekly earnings, you know, why are you still persisting with uh, showing an increase in the number of transactions, albeit slightly diminished from your original forecast? Sorry, I was, I was going to, I thought your question was going in a different direction, so I don't have that answer. Does anyone want to pick that up? Um, I mean, what we, what we are reflecting in the numbers is that we've seen more higher value transactions, which seem to be rather muted um, more recently in the past. And now we've seen more of those. And so that has increased the, uh, the tax revenue that's come in, although we've seen lower transactions, um, particularly at the lower end of the housing market. And these things you know, may also just even out a little bit over time. I don't well, give a better I, I, answer. I, I'll, I'll, uh, not a better answer, but I'll, I'll supplement that by saying, first of all, the housing market is inherently volatile and, and difficult to forecast, and therefore LBTT is difficult to forecast. And, and the, the way that one, for, one forecasts this is, is, is a mixture of, uh, of looking at, at long-run averages, long-run trends, and, and short-run behaviour. So when you... When you, see, when you get new information that says, oh, the housing market this year has behaved in an in a unexpected way, prices have been unexpectedly high, or transactions unexpectedly low, or transactions unexpectedly high at the top end of the market, 
that then feeds into the forecast because it would be foolish to ignore the fact and to assume that what happened in 2017 was purely 2017. It would be natural to think, well, it might well continue to go on in 2018. But you also don't throw away the long-run information. So, so, it, so new information does shift the forecast uh, for the, the next period. But one year of new information doesn't have a big impact on the long-run forecast. So, we're, so just to pick up what you said about transactions, we're not going to completely change our, our view of what the, a sensible forecast is for transactions because of one year's data. It shifts it, as is reflected here, but uh, we still give a lot of weight to the long-run average, both in respect of prices and transactions. That's the way that kind of statistical modelling works. Uh, so you're not seeing a relationship between transactions and earnings? No, the... the in, in a formal sense, I'm looking to John to correct me or add to it if, I, if, I, if, the, if this is not right. But, but the, the, the housing market model is essentially a, a self-contained model driven by data in the housing market, and we don't have a, a big feed into it from the, the rest of the economy. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in landfill tax, and I'm aware that um, landfill tax is an environmental tax intended to incentivise waste disposal in landfill sites, and um, your report shows that all taxes are supposed to increase with the exception of landfill tax. And I know it's not just as simple as a standard rate for waste disposal and there's incineration involved. In that. So could you clarify, just in terms of forecasting for landfill tax, um, will it continue to reduce? Um, we believe it will continue to re reduce. There are some key factors that influence that. Um, one of them is the uh, rate of development of incineration in Scotland, because that then takes a lot of uh, what would normally, or in the past, have gone to landfill. And th th that means building kit. That's a construction project for each incinerator. And that involves time and construction and planning and so forth. Um, so those that, that trajectory isn't absolutely certain. The other thing is the ban on bio degradable municipal waste, um, which as it comes into effect, is bound to have you know, something. So that's mainly from households, and all of the councils have to find a way to um, avoid putting that um, BMW, as it's called, um, which has another meaning, I suppose, um, putting that into landfill. And there are various things that can happen. If the incineration isn't ready, um, that waste can be exported. Uh, you know, if the incineration is ready, it can go there. Uh, so there are some uncertain factors, therefore uncertain timings around that. But we do believe that over time, that take will go down. And that's, of course, what we want. Okay. Okay. Maybe sure. Just to build on what Susan said, I think yeah. um, actually in terms of the numbers set out in report, I mean it, the, the landfill tax is working very effectively in terms of reducing mm -hmm. the, um, the the numbers. There's a bit of a, a decline in that sort of rate of fall almost. Is not confusing things by saying that caused by a, a delay in, um, in incineration facilities, but overall the, the trend is quite strongly downwards. And uh, what we we haven't yet made a specific judgment on the further reductions that will be that will result from the the, the BMW ban um, but we will do that once the the full regulatory framework to put that ban into place is is all set out and we have all the information of that which we we would hope would be for in our December report and that will show significant further reductions again okay okay thanks. Thank, well, okay thank you very much to the panel for coming along I don't envy your job Forecasting is not an easy thing to do, particularly when you're dealing with a, a new process. There's inevitably going to, going to be unintended consequences. We've got a fiscal framework which has, a, a, from my perspective, a significant reliance on forecasting from two different bodies, which inevitably is going to produce a lot more risk and a lot more turbulence. And at some stage, we're going to have some sort of risk analysis to this process, not the actual numbers themselves. And maybe that's something the committee will need to think about for the longer term. But in the meantime, thank you very much for coming along this morning. I now suspend for five minutes.
Okay, the second item on our agenda today is to consider the Scottish Government's medium term financial strategy. And I welcome to the meeting Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution, John Nicholson, who is the Deputy Director for Financial Scrutiny and Outcomes, Eden Griswood, who is the Deputy Director of Financial Responsibility Division, and Simon Fuller, who is the Acting Deputy Director in the Scottish Government. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Convener, in view of the fact I've given a statement to Parliament and taking questions, the members have now had more time to read the medium term financial strategy. I, I propose I just go straight to your questions. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll go straight to Emma Harper. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm just interested in uh, about the Office of uh, Budget Responsibilities forecast that productivity is expected to be slow. And I'm interested to know if you can outline what interventions that you could take forward and to boost the economy and what levers are at your disposal to do so. Convener, I, I, I would say, of course, that I think it's a very interesting um, analysis now between what the OBR is predicting for the UK economy and what the SFC is saying about the Scottish economy. And part of that is driven by... Uh, their, their assumptions indeed differing methodology. So OBR has taken a top-down approach to the Scottish economy, SFC, as they would argue, eh, as it, indeed they have done eh, this morning, a kind of bottom-up eh, component approach to the economy. So looking into that, eh, productivity is clearly a challenge. Actually, since 2007, so over a period of, of, of devolution, but we've had a, a strong track record of improving productivity within Scotland. Uh, some divergence over the last couple of years, the reasons for which no one has been able to quite identify yet. The SFC report uh, touches upon that um, as well. So where we can um, deliver support uh, around uh, improvement and enhancement here is some of the interventions we're making uh, as a devolved uh, government. Um, around investment in skills and innovation and enterprise in our economic strategy that is about industrialisation to high quality, such as the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland that's currently proposed, as well as all the other investments around upscaling business growth, internationalisation, innovation hubs and connecting our universities with business functions as well, New South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. So there's a, a range of economic interventions that will be good for the economy, economic growth, but within that, productivity as well. A couple of other key points. Participation is important in productivity. The productivity challenge in Scotland, it could be argued, uh, was partly down to the downturn on oil and gas. So that's at onshore impacts as well as offshore tax take, uh, as well as the population challenge that we have, as have been discussed and is now well understood. A, a shrinking population, but a shrinking population and an ageing population. Uh, it's great that people are living longer, but that will have an impact on uh, earnings, productivity, and other factors. So the working age population, uh, 16 to 64, so all that's changing. That's probably having an impact on the um, productivity uh, drivers as well. So, uh, in the government's interventions, we're doing as much as we can. Where we don't have control, I've tried to express in the medium term financial strategy, and in many other places why population and participation within that is so important, because it's not just about throwing money at these things, it's absolutely about understanding the composition and demographics of our nation and then being able to respond to it. And that's why immigration, not within our control, but is a factor uh, within the productivity challenge as well. So we should reflect on the positives. We've enhanced a lot over the period. Um, but there is absolutely more we can do, and that's why we're doing it through our economic interventions, as I've, I've just described. OK, thank you. Thanks. Ash. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and the rest of the panel. So we've obviously heard from the Scottish Fiscal Commission this morning about immigration, that they've used um, you know, a slightly different population variant than you know, another one that was available to them, and that might be maybe a bit more um, pessimistic, perhaps, in their um, forecast. Um, and that the size of the working age population is really important, obviously, for our tax receipts, and that obviously feeds into the public finances. So in your report, you've got a section on immigration. Um, and just to run through a couple of the conclusions that are in there, so you've got the Brexit effect. Um, so reduced migration could reduce Scotland's GDP by up to 4.5% per year. And then um, on top of that, you've also got um, the fact that the UK has additional net migration targets 
which, if they were reached, could have an effect on Scotland's GDP to the tune of 9.3% lower by 2040. And then, just to put a number on that, that's 10.2 billion of lost GDP to Scotland. So clearly, that is really, really significant in, in the context of the Scottish budget, but completely out with Scotland's control. So what, what can be done here? Uh, well, clearly, I would argue that it would be better to have more controls around immigration naturally. And also, it's clear the government is trying to help get the UK government in a better place in relation to the Brexit negotiations and then beyond that immigration target. So it has an impact on the whole of the UK, but a very specific and I would argue disproportionate impact on Scotland for the reasons that you've given. The, but all the Brexit scenarios were bad enough in terms of impact on our GDP, impact on our population, impact on our working age population, impact on specific sectors, whether that's the NHS, you know, a whole range of sectors affected uh, by this. Uh, but beyond that, the kind of reducing uh, immigration to the tens of thousands, as the Prime Minister's discussed, is, is singularly unhelpful to Scotland's economy. We need to grow our economy, grow our population, grow our working age population, and of course make the best of those who want to enter uh, the labour market. But these are clear economic challenges for Scotland. And it's an, actually an area in which there's a lot of consensus in Scottish politics, certainly in the Parliament, every parliamentary party pretty much agrees on the, on the needs of Scotland's economy in that regard in relation to immigration. But the UK one-size-fits-all policy is not appropriate, it's counterproductive to our ambitions in this country, uh, as well as the, the social side um, uh, uh, of, of, of immigration as well, and how it enhances the diversity of your country. But just thinking about it from a hard-headed economic point of view, it will subdue our potential around economic uh, growth as well as presenting a whole host of challenges. What can we do? We are running a promotional campaign uh, for Scotland to be a great place to live, work and invest in. Uh, clearly, we are, we've got those international efforts within the UK. We want Scotland to be seen as attractive um, uh, as well. And we've got a far more welcoming and positive case to make around immigration. I think all of that helps, but when we don't set the numbers or you know the the attitudes of 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 some of that then we certainly have an issue i think it's a reason to have more immigration control within the scottish parliament so that we can better use those uh, those particular levers to support our economy and the, the needs of our, our nation as well. Just one other point to make, that immigration uh, generally is positive for the country. It net contributes to the figures you gave are correct from a, a global context on GDP and economic performance, but for per head, for every EU migrant to Scotland, the net contribution is something like thirty odd thousand pounds net contribution to GDP. And from my point of view, the fiscal tax takes about ten thousand pounds. So um, Drawing up the drawbridge, pulling down the barriers and telling people they're not welcome is most unhelpful to Scotland's economic needs. Yes, obviously it does have a big impact on Scotland's economic needs. I know the Scottish Government has continued to make the case you know, at the UK Government level about maybe Scotland having a bit more control over immigration. Are conversations on that topic ongoing? Yeah, well, they are. I mean, there's, there's a range of conversations at the moment, of course, in relation to EU um, and negotiations to Brexit and to the constitutional arrangement. I think, I think that looking at the fiscal framework, uh, the Smith Agreement and the Scotland Act, frankly, I think the time has come to look again at what further powers Scotland should have. If we collectively accept that there is a challenge to Scotland's economy, Surely it follows that we should have the appropriate levers to put us in a better position. So I think the time has come to be able to look again in a positive and constructive way what other levers or differential approach could Scotland have to enhance our uh, economic uh, position. Now, that can be in the context of Brexit. We've been trying to do that in terms of um, Scotland's place in Europe. Uh, but in any event, we, we should have much, uh, I think, uh, deeper conversations with the UK government around what powers we could have. Now, we are trying. Uh, clearly, we are it's a maximalist uh, government uh, in terms of you know, the more powers that come to Scotland, the better, in, the, in, a, in our view. We have our own constitutional view. 
Uh, but I think immigration is just a case in point as to how the current system, the current UK economic model, just does not suit Scotland, and we could do better if we had more levers in that regard. And, and the case is made by the increasing body of evidence that we have. Thank you. OK, thanks, Ash. We're going into scrutiny areas now. Adam? Uh, thanks, Camina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, I welcome the publication of the Scottish Government's medium-term fiscal uh, financial strategy. Um, this was, of course, a key component of the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group. And the Budget Process Review Group was assembled, partly by this committee, with your assistance as the Scottish Government, um, to improve parliamentary scrutiny of the Scottish Government's budget, which is one of the first things that we had exchanges about uh, in the Chamber a couple of years ago, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so can you just explain to us how the publication of this document, in your view, will assist the Scottish Parliament in holding the Scottish Government to account for its financial strategy? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's an excellent question because I think it, it is only the beginning. It's the first time that we, we've done it collectively and I'm open to suggestions about what else could be including and how it can evolve uh, going forward uh, as well. The, um, the request to produce it I think comes off the back of the view that in changing the, in a reflection on the timetable of the uh, Scottish budget, there's now accepted that the Scottish budget can only follow the UK government's budget. Of course, their rhythm of business has changed for to have a, uh, a UK budget now in the autumn, although it's strange how the autumn is defined in that regard, but a UK budget in the autumn and then a UK spring statement. So it makes sense now in the rhythm of business for the Scottish government to be compelled to produce uh, such a statement and outlook, because it's an outlook of what lies before us as well and to then be open to question on that. Um, so in offering the statement, the questions, and now this parliamentary scrutiny allows us to, to look more in depth at this point in time as to what the fiscal outlook um, is, what the key principles and factors are for government and therefore parliament to wrestle with. And of course, crucially, it coincides with the publication of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's latest forecasts that inform that debate. So I think for all of those reasons, it's good to be able to take this opportunity. Of course, uh, I return to Parliament on outturn, so actual outturn figures, return to Parliament on uh, the uh, uh, Scotland Act implementation, as I have done, but then there'll be the fiscal framework reporting as well, uh, which will reflect on the outturn figures from that, those particular arrangements. So I think this is, this is very helpful engagement. And for all of Parliament, I think as the Parliament's powers are maturing, and, and scrutinies is absolutely taken seriously by this committee. So too should the responsibility be upon opposition members, as well as government, to look at all the issues before us to take a responsible approach to the balanced budgeting now and into the future. Thank you for that response. The, um, I mean, clearly this committee will, you know, must play and will continue to play a lead role in, in budget scrutiny. But one of the um, themes that ran throughout the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group's recommendations is. Um, that subject committees also needed to play a role in, in a, a greater role than they were previously able to do because of the very constrained timetable available for um, parliamentary scrutiny of the Scottish budget for reasons that you just outlined. Um, uh, so can you point me to the, what, what's in this document that is new, that we didn't previously know, uh, that will help subject committees of this parliament scrutinise um, the, the, Scottish budget, the Scottish government's budget? In terms of my own medium-term financial strategy, I, I'm sure there's a paragraph near the end in the conclusion that says it doesn't present new policies. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do that. It was never intended to do that. It was a point in time of the fiscal position, the latest fiscal commission forecast, and bringing together into one place what the government saw as its priorities within that. Uh, there are new statements, uh, but there are no new policies in terms of I'm just announcing another whatever it is for whatever it could be. But what I have done is place in the public domain real-time current suggestions and how we could address some problems at source. For example, the UK fiscal path, if it were, if it were to change, as I've suggested in the paper and I said so in the chamber, it could unlock, as a minimum, £60 billion for the UK's economy and public expenditure and turn a £5 billion for Scotland. So there's a new... Um, political argument in the paper. Policy context is it's bringing together that which um, uh, already exists and is refined by the latest uh, numbers and analysis we've got. In terms of scenario planning, if I hadn't published scenario plans, I'm sure committee would have asked me to publish scenario plans, so I've put them in 
a, as, as illustrative as to the scenarios that we could be looking at. And I heard the SFC, because I watched their evidence this morning, um, describe this as the, the starting point for the budget itself. And I think it's a good place to be that all of Parliament is thinking about, well, yes, what are our priorities at this stage going forward? So I think it's a, a really useful document. It was never intended to launch new policies, but it has set out new information, fiscal paths, illustrative examples, the financial context we're working with. And Patrick Harvey said in relation to a question last week in, 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 the, in the document, this was never expected to set out detailed portfolio spending plans. It's not appropriate to do that. It would all be just like forecast subject to change in any event. But if the committee has further suggestions as to how you would like it refined, I'm, I'm very open to that. Um, so, you know, obviously, we're the, we're the Finance Committee, but if we were the Health Committee, how would the publication of this document help us? As a, how, how will it help the Parliament's Health Committee scrutinise the medium-term financial stability of the NHS in Scotland? Or if you don't like health as an example, take education or take policing and justice. How, how, how will the content of this document help enhance effective parliamentary scrutiny of your government's budget proposals going forward over the course of the remainder of this parliament? Because that, that's the bit, the puzzle that I, 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 I frankly think is missing. Okay, I, I think it's a very fair question, uh, but my answer would be um, very clear. The paper sets out the principles for the government, the government's key commitments. Now, when the government makes statements in the chamber about what our commitments are, you know, that's obviously very important, but setting out in a fiscal strategy, a financial strategy, shows that we're serious about delivering uh, in that regard. Because it also describes the challenge. If you say, here are our priorities, because everything can't be a priority, and it sets out the, the share of the budget that would be involved in the key commitments, but I think it does give that greater certainty that we're serious about those key commitments uh, because it's within our medium-term financial strategy. So I, I, I think that is quite important. Any committee of this parliament can do what you're doing right now in terms of scrutinising the appropriate cabinet secretary to the spending plans going forward. That was the purpose of all year round scrutiny, not just wait to the three week period of the budget process itself, well, between UK budget and my announcement of draft budget, but all year round scrutiny means cabinet secretaries and ministers can be called to account on, on what's happening in real time. But really importantly, that health question, I gave other examples as well if I didn't like health, but I'll take health as the first in line, as the one you've given me. I think clearly uh, the government's committed to more financial detail around how you meet the health challenges, recognising the, the demographic challenges, the expectations, the cost of providing services, all of that. Uh, so we will imminently also publish, as was committed to Parliament, essentially a medium-term financial strategy for the health service specifically uh, as well. Now, we've committed to do that. Uh, it refers to, I think, uh, in my own medium-term financial strategy, but we said we would outline um, more uh, detail around specifically health, um, showing uh, the need for ongoing uh, transformation, going hand-in-hand uh, hand with investment at the same time. Now, Health Committee can scrutinise that, Finance Committee uh, can scrutinise that as well. Um, but they will, those, um, those documents certainly work uh, with each other, and health requires that very specific look, because, of course, health is the lion's share of, of, of the the Scottish Government's budget for good reason, and these examples, these illustrations of scenarios show just how dominant it will be in future spending to meet the commitments that have made, been made around health. And within this, it describes the extra £2 billion um, uh, increase for, for health, which is the Government's manifesto uh, commitment. But more detail to come, as I say, in that specific health paper. It, what does it say to education? What does it say to police? And what does it say to justice, as the other examples that Mr Tompkins gave? Well, it says what our key commitments are in that regard. It was never meant to be a, a, an operational um, a document about each individual part of the public sector, but set out how we propose to invest in that. So it reinforces a, a Real terms increase in resource and police. It also refers to the VAT issue, um, and you know clearly that that sits within the justice portfolio or in education. Uh, it sets out the, the principle around access to education uh, and also the use of say the, the the pupil attainment fund as well, and the commitment around three quarters of a billion pounds to tackle the attainment gap in Scotland. 
So it's an update of the budget, it's a forward look, and it sets out the, the fiscal position as we see it right now, I think with a lot of policy um, content. And the committee can certainly come back in any particular strand that it would like more on. Thank you. Alex. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, we probably touched on it a bit already. Um, yeah, as, as Adam Tompkins was talking about, the budget process review, review, review group uh, set out the four elements it was recommending, one of which was yeah, clear policies. And uh, yeah, as you've already mentioned, uh, in the conclusion, it says that there's no new decisions or policy commitments set out. You, you said that wasn't the intention, but yeah, is the opportunity available to you to be able to do that? And, and really, if you know, in light of you know, these new you know, dramatic change in projections, if, if this wasn't the opportunity to do so, when, when, when would you be? Well, I think government can announce new policies uh, any time it likes in accordance with parliamentary protocol. This is a really opportune moment to reflect on the current forecast. But you know, I mean, that's, that's the key point here. Reflecting on the SFC forecast is, is, is timely right now. They come out same time as medium term financial strategy. Um, if we were to choose to, to change policy on something, fine, I could have done it. It was part of the statements, part of the document, and done at that point. What I've chosen to do is re-emphasise the priorities of the government. I've made fiscal uh, suggestions as to how we can enhance our economic position as well. I've referred to you know, austerity, Brexit, caps and migration. Um, I've covered the fiscal plans of the government, um, reflected on the fiscal forecasts. So I think there's quite a lot in it. And um, if 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 something comes out of this in terms of policy, if I had one wish what can come of this document, I mean, I have many wishes, you know, UK government change course and a whole host of things, but I think a helpful debate is emerging on immigration. And if something comes of this, but is around the consensus on immigration and how important participation and population is for Scotland's future, we need those powers now, and we need access to those levers now. And if I'm hearing consensus across the Parliament in that regard, it might not have been a policy announcement, but maybe we have found a new consensus on immigration that we should take forward, because there's an increasing body of evidence of how important it is to our economic prospects now and into the future, for all the reasons that you've quite exhaustively explored as a committee. So uh, that might not have been a new policy announcement, but it's certainly an aspiration I, I think is finding a great deal of um, consensus. Of course, the big moment for... Uh, new spending plans as a budget. And clearly, as a minority government, we have to work with other parties to secure the passing of uh, the budget. Uh, a First Minister's programme for government is a key point for policy intervention um, as well. But I think this serves what was asked of me, of the medium-term financial strategy in terms of the budget process review group. Thank you. OK, come and say, let's go on to income tax forecasts. Because when you first saw the numbers from the Fiscal Commission in regard to the, 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 their forecasts on income tax, that must have been an uncomfortable moment for yourself and the government. Because, as we heard earlier from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, that for 2018-19, their tax forecast is lower by £208 million than it was in December. Uh, in addition, in relation to obviously the block grant adjustment and the OBR projections, add further challenges to you, potentially producing a, sh a shortfall somewhere close to four hundred million pounds. That's, that's on the face of it, and I realise that we're in a new process and there's turbulence in its forecasting and forecasts are forecasts. But I think it would be helpful for this committee to understand what you think that Im the impact of this will be on your budget. Of course, convener, there's no immediate impact. I'm sure the committee is well aware of that because the numbers of the forecasts are locked in to the budget setting itself. I know the committee is aware of that, but probably um, it's worth reinforcing that point. The second point I would make is around methodology, that the OBR and the SFC use different methodology and they have different approaches. Yes, I'm the finance secretary in the middle that has to use the OBR's forecast that's the driver for the block grant adjustment and then the SFC's forecast in terms of what can actually be drawn down from Treasury. So we all knew that this was a complex situation, complexity from the fiscal framework and then complexity because of the forecasts themselves. Of course, we have civil servants um, uh, and I get the end of process update from uh, uh, the chair, uh, uh, Dame Susan Rice, uh, but 
So there's challenge meetings with civil servants in our economy to understand their workings, their thinking, how they arrive at those numbers. Uh, so on first sight of them, let's say I was as surprised as the committee that there is such a change in forecasts between the December analysis and what we see now. Um, the SFCs described that as evolution in their judgment, and of course they've explained some of that to you this morning. Obviously in the SFC substantial report, they do point out the risks of forecasting and how uh, it's very rare for any forecast or economist to get anything absolutely right, but we're relying on SFC forecasts and OBR forecasts to, 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 to lead to, to our numbers. The first point of reassurance I would give, though, is that the government always competently balances the books. So I give that assurance as Finance Secretary. I will balance the books. We will deliver sound, competent government with some of these um, challenges around the economy. The, the UK economy is subdued within the EU context, and the Scottish economy subdued within that context as well, partly because of the things we've been discussing earlier around participation, productivity, and population. What was curious, though, is that um, hey, there was a, 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 an analysis that I don't think was fully explained by the SFC around the impacts on, on wage earnings, and that's a key issue here, wage earnings. Because the SFC says simultaneously that their economic forecasts for GDP haven't changed. In fact, in some years, they've gone up. So there's no real change in the GDP forecast. So the downgrade, as they see it, in the income tax forecast, and it's only the forecast um, a, by 1.7%, um, they attribute to that kind of wage earnings issue that they've done more analysis of. So it wasn't necessarily that anything's changed in the economy, uh, as I say, because GDP is broadly, broadly the same from, from their five-year forward look. Um, some people have described OBR as quite optimistic and SFC is quite pessimistic. And that, of course, increases the gap, the, the volatility that, that, that we are dealing um, with. Um, other reasons for me to be more cheerful in that regard is these are not the final forecasts. We'll get to nearer the end of the year. So just before the budget, when we get the SFC's latest forecast, we'll also get the OBR's forecast that will drive the block grant adjustment and UK government decisions. OBR will all, already have to revisit their figures because right now outturn is already different from what the OBR was forecasting. So we already know the OBR's got it wrong and that's just a matter of time. So the sequencing of all of this, we'll have the best up-to-date information closer to the UK budget and the Scottish budget. Then we'll also have more data, more actual hard data and I think that that'll be better than just some of the forecasting we've got at the moment. So I hope that's some reassurance around the forecasting and the methodology uh, elements of this um, uh, as well. In relation to, so how does a finance secretary respond to this? So the levers we'll have at our disposal. Remembering of course that the currently devolved taxes uh, can be managed in year or the year after because of the nature of currently devolved taxes. With income tax there's the uh, outturn figures which is two year and then essentially the, the knock-on effect of those figures in the, the third year. So if you take 2017-18 figures, of course, it's 2020-21 before those, that, that any change that's required there actually takes effect. So these forecasts give us time to prepare, um, if that's what we're preparing for. The levers we have at our disposal, of course, try and stimulate the economy, support economic growth, uh, use uh, potentially the Scotland Reserve if that's uh, required. Budget exchange, of course, as it used to be known, the, the carryover, um, and then a borrowing powers, if that was required to address a forecast error. If it is a forecast error, then known at that point um, of a outturn. Uh, but within all of that, um, the GDP forecasts, uh, as they are, of course, uh, represent a subdued but growth outlook growth outlook. There's, a bit, there's still real terms of economic growth there. The final point I would make around income tax, it, notwithstanding the fact that um, LBTT and landfill tax, eh, eh, LBT specifically, um, the forecast for that have improved. But on income tax, the SFC in revisiting their forecasts, any figure of downgrade 
must also be seen in the context that revenues are still increasing. So revenues are still increasing year on year for income tax in Scotland. And as a consequence of the decisions that the government and ultimately Parliament took in the budget, we're £2 billion better off, even with those later, latest forecasts, because of the tax decisions that we've taken. And that's an important figure because that's the sum that if we hadn't taken those tax decisions, we would have been down by if we hadn't taken the tax decisions in relation to income tax. So important point, income tax is still going up year on year. GDP is still increasing in Scotland year on year. But within those forecasts, the SFC uh, revisiting them, of course, means I need to um, uh, uh, prepare for a range of scenarios, including those far, uh, forecasts coming to pass. But I've got a great deal of um, evidence to suggest, of course, that they will change before uh, the budget. Okay, and you, you hinted in your, or did more than hinted in your, your answer there, um, about the HMRC figures that will be published in the summer. Now, in paragraph 31 of the summary from the Fiscal Commission, they say that there, because of these figures not yet being available, there remains significant uncertainty over the measurement of Scottish income tax base. So come the middle of the summer, we'll begin to get some certainty. Now, I know that the Scottish Government have got to rely on the forecasts that are made in December, but for the first time we'll have some hard numbers um, to put against some of this. Now, Again, recognising you've got to rely on forecasts. If these numbers start to tell you you've got a problem at that stage, what will you do then? In terms of if the SFC forecasts are right and that looks like outturn being as it is, well, first of all, I think, again, you can't just answer that in isolation because it relates to OBR. So already knowing that the OBR was too optimistic and the actual outturn figures for the UK are different. So knowing that the key determinant in our final figure is about to change anyway, knowing that, um, even if the SFC is right, at this stage we know that the OBR is wrong. So um, it's so complex, of course. If it, if, it, if it comes to pass that the SFC is right in their own forecast, what I actually have to spend is still determined by the OBR number and the block grant adjustment in any event. But no matter what, the government will continue to focus on growing our economy, making the right interventions to keep unemployment low. Because something else lost in the debate of the last few days is that the SFC also forecasts for unemployment to remain low at near record low levels, employment to remain at, at high levels, record high levels. And within that as well, um, the, there's, there's an issue for us around capacity, capacity to grow our economy within those economic parameters. And again, you return to immigration. How do you expand your capacity? We you bring more people into the labour market. You expand childcare. You, you have people with appropriate skills. You upskill your workforce. You support businesses to grow. You internationalise. And that's a range of economic interventions the government is making. Uh, but, but these numbers will change. If you go through the report um, of the, the, the Fiscal Commission, they touch on a, a number of times how uh, population and productivity is important. But even in relation to their own uh, forecast, I was quite drawn to page 29 of their own report on the limitations of forecasting. And they say of forecasters, forecasts cannot predict or perfectly predict the future. Um, goes on to say in 1.6, forecasting is an ongoing process of intelligence gathering, learning from previous forecasts, reflection and refinement, Judgment will be made on the basis of the best evidence and intelligence available at the time of publication, but may change from one forecast to the next as the economy evolves and our understanding develops along with it. The final point, and this is um, making reflections on the OBR and the OBR making reflections on himself, uh, bottom of page 29, the likelihood that any given forecast will turn out to be accurate in all respects is essentially negligible. That's very helpful to... Um, help guide us. But, convener, we will scenario plan. We will prepare for a range of scenarios. But, but we see a clear need to continue to grow our economy, and that's why we've got a range of strategies and interventions so to do. Just finally, before I come to murder, on that point you've just made from reading out these particular paragraphs, it's obvious they were in a new process. There will be unintended consequences, as I said earlier, to the, to the Fiscal Commission. The fiscal framework is built on the whole area of forecasts, which are never accurate. 
effectively, is what you've just said. Um, if all the, and how it operates is obviously, uh, as, we're, as we're beginning to see that more and more visibly about the, the, the complexity of the system, what risk analysis are the government planning to undertake in that regard? Because I think this is something the committee will come back to. I think some of the risk analysis is in the document in terms of the central scenario and funding that we would have available then the upper range and the lower range as well. So that sets the parameters of where we think the risks are and it's, it sets... I, I meant the risk of the actual process we're dealing with here well, as well. It, well, I think, of course, there's to be a review, an independent review of That's the process leading to uh, UK government and Scottish government... Uh, Revisiting this by 2021, um, the other point I would make, and, and this goes back to the more powers point, and of course I would make this point as a, a nationalist minister, but doesn't the nature of forecasts, even knowing that well-established forecasters with well-established institutions and methodology, they've also stated that they can't get it right perfectly every time either. So the difference the UK government has that we don't is more levers. So we only have a, some of the levers to be able to handle that economic risk, to handle that volatility as it can be um, seen. So, so more levers, in addition to the borrowing powers, uh, in addition to having a reserve, because of course there are caps on how much I can draw down from that reserve as well. So I think we do need more flexibility in the event of worst case scenarios. Now, I've given a clear assurance that will set a balanced budget, we'll tackle the challenges, very positive and constructive ways to do that, but clearly more fiscal flexibility it would allow us to do that. And it's also why I lent quite heavily on some of the choices that the UK government can make right now as well, whether that's on their approach on austerity, whether that's an approach on Brexit, whether that's on the, the borrowing powers or other elements that, that, that we could have would put us in a stronger position where we absolutely act responsibly, but convener, we can tackle that risk because it's a fair point you've touched upon this potential volatility from forecasters saying different things. Maybe a fair question, a fair point I've touched on, but you've not given, any, given me an answer. To uh, the answer I was wanting was around, are the government intended to take any risk analysis into the actual process that we're involved in? And if you are, when's it likely to happen? I know, I'll know about 21, but yeah. we're going to start work on that, I think, early to make sure we can out, sort out the outcomes. Yeah, we, we, our, well, our, our current analysis has gone into this if you think and i think it's right to say should we develop our thinking around this approach in the budget and then beyond yes we can do further analysis and if you wish present that to uh, the committee and ultimately to uk government well in advance of 2021 so yes is the answer to your question i think we can do more of that kind of work yeah no okay uh, thank you murder uh, uh, th thank you convener just a couple of questions i want to ask just to follow up some of the points the, the convener made uh, i mean you're absolutely fair cabinet secretary to talk about the fact that this is simply a forecast and it's subject to change. It may be that talking about you know, a £400 million gap in the current year's budget is unduly pessimistic. And that it, would be unlikely. Mr Fraser. Uh, well, however, I was going to say it may prove to be unduly optimistic. We simply don't know and will we'll become clear nearer the time. And we won't know the figures until June 2020, so it will be the, the budget for 2021-22 that will need to take account of this. Now, you know, I'm assuming you're not intending to leave to your successor a note saying, sorry, there's no money left. So I'm assuming that you're planning to make some <laughs> contingency planning uh, in the interim. There's nothing in the document you published uh, last week that suggests any contingency planning. So perhaps you can flesh out a bit in terms of your answer to the, uh, the convener. What sort of timescale are we looking at to get some understanding from yourself as to how the, the gap will be filled? There's an implication in your document last week that you're not planning any further tax changes. Is, is, is that fair uh, understanding? And if so, does that mean there need to be changes in spending patterns? Uh, firstly, on tax, can you, if I can just address that one, um, first of all, I think we've got a, a settled structure in terms of income tax. I think the nature of the changes, the five bands, and the structure that we have in terms of being supportive of the economy, more progressive, supporting lower income uh, uh, earners and using the tax system in a more progressive way uh, is the right balance. So I think the structure of income tax uh, uh, is now uh, the right one. I can come back specifically to the scenario planning in this regard uh, because it relates to the question around multi-year budgeting. So if the UK government commits to, and I think they have, a, a, a spending review for spring 2019, 
Um, and if they give out enough certainty to us, then at least we'll have a, a clear line of sight into what um, the block grant should look like. Of course, st still a substantial part of the um, Scottish budget. So if they do a, a multi-year spending review, and that gives us a great deal of certainty, my intention would be to emulate that, to try and give a multi-year spending review for Scotland as well. Now, clearly there's a lot of dynamics in that. There's the, um, uh, there's the fiscal framework. There would be the, um, the, the issues we've discussed around a tax a forecast and those other determinants. But I would try and deliver a, a multi-year um, settlement. So that would be good for, for planning. It's good for everyone. It depends on um, the settlements. And I suppose that takes us back to the scenario planning that the convener was asking about. If I had that certainty in the spring of 2019, we could probably more clearly be able to set out what the fiscal look, uh, outlook was like going forward over whatever period the UK government chooses. But it does take us back to the complexity point that, you know, in this regard, you know, all paths lead back to, to London and Westminster and the Treasury, because whatever we do in tax is all relative to what, in terms of what we have at our disposal by way of resources, is relative to what UK government does on tax as well. So that's a block grant or our own tax decisions. Because of the fiscal framework, it's all um, relative back uh, to that. So I suppose um, if the UK government gives us that certainty and we have clarity um, on their tax position as well, it gives us deeper clarity for us to be able to plan. Because, of course, uh, there's some debate, even in the Conservative Party right now, about departing from the current position on tax. Um, so I know what the manifesto position is. I'm now hearing different, different positions, including from, from Ruth Davidson, on tax and how it relates to public expenditure. It, so for us to be able to set out more clarity on our own tax plans, it's, it's helpful to have the UK government's tax plans as well because of the nature of the fiscal framework. But within that convener, what I'm trying to describe is all the range of determinants lead us to a place where we can more accurately show you what the scenarios look like when we have those key drivers coming from the UK government. But in relation to tax and spend, tax, I think, is a pretty settled position. In relation to the structure on expenditure, I've set out the challenges, the determinants, the key policies within uh, the document. Clearly, this is the start of the process leading to the Scottish budget and then potentially a UK spending review as they've announced it uh, in the spring of 2019. Oh, hopefully, that's more helpful. Okay. So I think I take from that that spending is more likely to change than taxation. We have to spend within the, the envelope that we've set out and the scenarios that we've set out. And what I've tried to define within the document is to deliver the key uh, commitments that we have. What are the kind of issues that need to be addressed within that? Now, there's a range of issues that need to be addressed within that that I'm quite clear about. Efficiency, transformation of public services, digitalisation, um, uh, uh, and the... Um, a, uh, tackling some of the expectation and demand issues for public services as well. And that's how it describes it, the shape uh, and, uh, of, of, say, the NHS budget is predicted to increase because there's clear commitment around the NHS, clear demands in the NHS, and that's why that, that kind of shape of the budget is characterised in the document. So it sets out public expenditure in here, as well as my current position on tax. Can I ask can you one, one more question around... Um, the question of immigration that you mentioned a couple of times in response to questions from uh, Ash Denham and then, then the convener. We've had in the UK over the last two decades relatively high levels of immigration, and yet the proportion of immigrants coming to Scotland within the UK has been relatively low. It's certainly been lower than our overall population share. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of issues to reflect on as to why that is the case, why we've been relatively poor at attracting immigrants to Scotland within the current um, constitutional arrangements. Andrew Wilson's Growth Commission uh, proposes offering tax cuts to immigrants to attract them to come here. I'm wondering what your view is on that policy and whether you accept the premise that higher taxes deter people from coming to Scotland. Uh, nice try, Mr Fraser. Um, uh, Mr Fraser is well aware, as is the committee, I was a member of the Growth Commission uh, as well as chair of my own uh, political uh, party. I'm convener of the, uh, the SNP, so I'm in a very curious position as well as being the Finance Secretary. Um, I think the Growth Commission is a great piece of work. Maybe we'll discuss it more fully um, 
at some point, it, of course it raises the point around um, people and productivity participation, but uh, immigration is a key, a key issue um, within that. It, the, the point about the Growth Commission, though, is there are some things we can do as a devolved government, but the package of things we can do, we can only do as an independent country with all the levers and all the tools and all the democratic and uh, fiscal opportunities that we would have. So as part of that whole package, you can take the right set of approaches to be able to attract a, a range of people. Uh, as it happens right now, as it stands right now, there are many people who want to come to Scotland, of course, and they just can't because of the UK regime, and it's going to get harder because of the proposed future UK regime. Population growth was only predicted to happen in Scotland because of positive forward inward migration. That's how important migration is to us. That, as it stands right now, is even without the tax incentives. The point that the paper and the Growth Commission makes is you can do more if you had all those particular levers. I mean, incidentally, how you connect, um, say, transaction taxes, LBTT, uh, with a wealth tax or income tax, it's quite interesting to have a, a proper package for attracting people. You would want to be able to align all of that. We can't. We just set the rates and the bans. We don't set the definitions. We don't set the criteria. We don't get to define what wealth is. And therefore, we don't directly control the agencies that do the administration. So you can't properly connect and join the dots to make such a package work as a devolved government the way that you could if you were an independent um, government. But within that, because I'm not one for just um, hoping that we get more powers, we've got to do what we can right now as well. And in that regard, uh, I agree we should look further about why um, uh, or how we can get more immigration to come to Scotland. The experience is very positive. We've had a, uh, the, the trajectory, the flow would have been that population growth in Scotland is largely down to forward migration. So people are coming. People do find that Scotland is a welcoming, attractive place to live, work and invest. But we can get more uh, across a range of skills, whether that is absolutely in farms and agricultural opportunities that Mr Fraser will be well aware of, or financial services, or whatever it happens to be. So the high scale, right across the whole range of sectors, that there's a need for, for immigration. So we could do even more if we were independent, but the current policy of the UK government is, is economically um, catastrophic. Do, I think that will do at that stage on that answer. It was quite a long answer, but I can un understand the temptation, Cabinet Secretary. James. Okay, thank you. Convener, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you said earlier that you were surprised when you received the forecast from the Fiscal Commission. Um, in truth, you must have been absolutely raging. Um, because <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you published your, your draft budget in December, in terms of the tax policy changes that you announced, uh, they were going to release an additional £164 million pounds into the budget. And these latest forecasts uh, taking £209 million, pounds, uh, not out of the actual budget, but out of the, the forecast, uh, effectively blow a hole in your, your kind of tax policy. It, I'm raging at those comments. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> that characterisation. <laughs> this is my raging face. Um, <laughs> I do think it's a good point. It's a good question. I watched your evidence session earlier on, and I say surprise. I was surprised as you, and you probed this quite rightly as well. How can the forecast change within five months without any major economic difference? So the GDP was broadly the same, drivers broadly the same. I had the same questions as you. My civil servants, without speaking you know, out of turn, had the same questions as you. Uh, economists had the same questions as you. Of course, I had some of these questions when I saw the original figures last year. Um, and uh, probe some of it then. In fact, I remember um, raising it with the committee that there was an almost inexplicable um, enhancement uh, that I said, you know, if these are the numbers I have to go with, hold me back. Uh, but I'm a prudent, responsible, um, sensible finance secretary that will make sure that we use the resources prudently. That said, um, on challenging the numbers in a constructive fashion, clearly the SFC has described it about methodology, deeper understanding, all the rest. So we'll revisit these forecasts when we have more data, more information, more actual outturn, and then we'll get more to real life. But we're still uh, reliant upon um, a forecast. 
In terms of the terminology of budget impact, there's no budget impact, of course, because the numbers are locked in. And arguably, the economic stimulus that will come from our pay policy, from the economic interventions, what we've done around non-domestic rates, what we've done around innovation, education, capital infrastructure, all of that is wise spending to help stimulate our economy, which, of course, in turn, the SFC did say would have a positive impact if you take just the pay policy on, on wage as well. So in terms of forward look on the budget, um, we will keep a close eye on their forecasts. Um, their change, of course, is only 1%. In terms of my own tax policy, one key point to remember is this. Income tax, so the other taxes are forecast to increase above previous forecasts. So they've been improved. They've been upgraded. You didn't read about that, but they've been upgraded. On income tax, every year, income taxes still generate more money in Scotland. So every year there are more tax receipts in Scotland. It's just that it's less than the forecast they gave us in December for the reasons they have given, and the tax decisions that I encourage Parliament to take has placed us £2 billion better off as a consequence. So that has, um, I think, vindicated my tax policy. Yeah. I thought your, uh, your answer to Murdo Fraser was very interesting in the sense that you were basically indicating uh, a no-changed uh, position in relation to tax. And, of course, the, the, the focus of these forecasts a lot has been on this year's budget, but it's the trend that's really concerning. And in terms of income tax, uh, the cumulative uh, impact of the, the, the forecast on the tax changes is to have £1.75 billion pounds less by 2022-23. And if you're signalling uh, a no-change policy in relation to taxation, what you're really signalling is massive cuts no. to public sector public spending and putting public no. sector uh, no, not true. services okay. under real pressure? No, that, that's not an accurate characterisation at all. In fact, that characterisation suggests that James Kelly is, is, uh, maybe needs to just get a slightly deeper understanding of the forecast. What I'm talking about, it doesn't mean less, less than what? Less than a previous um, SFC forecast is quite different from less than the budget or less money. So there is a world of difference in those interpretations. The first point I made at the outset in relation to forecasts is the OBR forecasts are already wrong. So one of the key determinants is already wrong, and that's just a matter of, t of time, just because of their reporting time scale then flowing into the, the, the outturn that they have. So SFC have, as I say, changed their forecast. That, that's a matter for them. Tax take, in terms of income tax, in Scotland is still up. Of course, the key determinant for us is what's income tax in the rest of the United Kingdom? What's the outturn? And that's what we need to, to understand as well as the SFC forecast. So in terms of what happens in the block grant, uh, the block grant adjustment, the actual tax take, that's what will determine our budgets. But if you look at our, if you look at our budget forecasts, they are projected uh, to, to increase overall. So you have to look at everything. So the way we've characterised income tax is only in relation to the SFC forecast. To then go on and say about the impacts you suggested it would might have, it means choices for Parliament government. You have to prioritise. You have to make choices. And you'll have the different levers in terms of tax and other things. One point I would want to correct, though, is around tax, going on from a uh, Murdo Fraser's point. Murdo Fraser asked me... Uh, broadly, is the, is the tax position settled? In terms of structure, I said, yes, it is. Five bar, five band system is broadly settled. I think that the way the government conducted the exercise of a consultation paper, we set out four key principles, which we delivered upon, protect the economy, protect lower income earners, use the system in a more progressive uh, fashion, uh, uh, invest in public services, oh, key, key factors, tests we set out uh, and we've delivered. I, Proposed to continue with those principles in relation to tax, as well as the Adam Smith principles of certainty, efficiency, uh, proportionality um, uh, as well. But certainty, I want to give people certainty, a greater de degree of certainty in these turbulent times, these uncertain times. And that's why I said I think that the, the structure is broadly settled. Uh, I think that's as much as I would say in the matter, okay. Convener. That's quite a lot. I think we'll just try to try to cut some of the answers down a bit if you can, Captain. Okay. Patrick. Thanks very much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, as you 
mentioned earlier, I, I said in the, the chamber last week that I don't think anybody expected this strategy document to include blow by blow, budget line by budget line projections. That would effectively be to ask for draft budgets for years in advance. I don't think anybody expected that. But I'd like to ask about a couple of things that aren't in there that I would have expected to see uh, in there. Uh, and the first, as you, as you know, that I'm interested in is local government. Um, the, the scenario graphs that start on page 61 include specific Scottish government policy commitments on health, social security, police attainment and, and so on, and leave a very large light blue chunk of those graphs as being other expenditure. Almost all, the large bulk of that other expenditure is surely local government, given the, the scale of what's, what's spent on local government. And yet the, the section which says, a few pages before that, page 58, following on from these, setting out these government policy commitments, what this means for spending elsewhere. And the first section there is local government. And all that that section says is, uh, we spend some money on local government, here's how much we're spending in 2018-19, uh, and that it includes the general revenue grant, NDR, and specific revenue grants. It doesn't say what the context of those policy commitments and the scenario plans means for local government. So what does this mean for local government in relation to the, the five-year plan here? I think, I think it's a fair question. Just as a technical point, in terms of the charts, of course, if you take early learning and childcare, um, then that's a function largely delivered by local government as well. So just a very small point. I know it's a tiny part of the, the chart, okay. but, I, but I just make the point that there are other elements of funding that don't necessarily... But the, but the large bulk of that light blue chunk is local government. Yeah, yeah, yes, I yeah. take that point, but I'm just saying it's not exclusive. There are other sure. elements of government funding that also make their way through uh, local government. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, I, I said at the outset of the, this evidence session that I wasn't launching new government uh, policy, if I had changed the position on uh, local government funding, I suppose that would have been a new policy initiative. And what, the, what these fiscal plans uh, represent is the government's uh, manifesto position, a programme for government position, and key announcements over the last few years since our re-election in 2016. And I think I accurately or I fairly describe the um, composition of the, uh, the Scottish budget if we protect those protected areas, those those key commitments that the government has set out, including, yes, the investment in the National Health Service, in police, and in, in education, and as it relates to, to attainment uh, and the other commitments. Then, of course, we have Social Security within that as an emerging new power as well. In relation to local government, my track record, um, uh, and Mr Harvey has been a contributor to this, clearly, in the budget negotiations and ultimately the parliamentary votes, has ensured that local governments had a better settlement than they were forecasting and preparing for, including the current financial year in which they had a uh, real terms a uh, uplift. So it's true to say I've not set out a, a, a fiscal path for local government, but to answer the question, because I know convenient you want me to be more concise, what does it mean for local government uh, on... My track record as finance secretary, I've tried to give local government the best deal possible in the circumstances, and I'll continue to do that. But I've set out very clearly what the government's key priorities are. If other parties have other key priorities, negotiate with me through the course of the budget, and that will be what ultimately Parliament approves or not. But I appreciate that you're saying this isn't a document for launching new policies, but it surely should say what the implication of your existing policy is in other areas. It's, it's not a party manifesto, it's a government financial strategy, mm -hmm. and one of the major areas of Scottish government expenditure is the contribu contribution to, to local government uh, and, and to the local services that it provides. And I would just suggest to you that that question remains, what this means for spending elsewhere, that question remains entirely unanswered to anybody who's read this document. Now, I'll, I'll take that point on board, but it sets out what the government's key priorities are, and it also shows what the shape and the composition of the portfolios and the Scottish, well, essentially what the Scottish government's budget is going to look like going forward as a consequence of that. It tries to do it uh, in that regard. Of course, that element, again, just as a technical point, the element of expenditure is simply expenditure to, to local government by way of financial support. It doesn't touch upon, for example, council tax. 
um, which is a matter for local government. So uh, I, I take the point, uh, but there, of course, is more to just local government finance than the revenue support grant or non-domestic rates that come via the Scottish Government. I had one question on capital as well. Yeah. I think James has got okay. one local government. I'll, I'll get one local government. Thank, right, thank, then I'll come thank back you. to you. Thanks, thanks, convener. Just following on from Patrick Harvey's comments, uh, Professor John McLaren at the weekend uh, warned the, the fact that local government wasn't one of your six priority areas would mean cuts for local government services. Do you agree with that analysis, or will you commit to real terms increases in future budgets for local councils? I haven't um, seen the nature of the analysis, so I think it's wrong for me to prejudge it and say something's right or wrong if I haven't seen the weekend analysis of that particular um, a article. I think I've set out my position with local government. Uh, local government is... Um, I have uh, done my best to give them the best settlement possible in the circumstances. I have live and ongoing discussions with local government, a range of matters, including the figures on housing investment, investment in early learning and childcare that we've reached a satisfactory uh, conclusion on, um, health and social care integration. It's incredibly uh, complex. Um, and as I approach the budget, I'll engage with COSLA as I engage with other political parties um, uh, as well. And they also have options around their um, council tax function. And, and yes, they're lobbying hard right now around discretionary taxes as well. So uh, I haven't set out a commitment to um, a specific real terms increase. But what I've clearly done on a case by case basis is negotiate with local government to reach a satisfactory conclusion, and a substantial one of that is early learning and childcare, where well, they now believe they have the resources to go on and deliver the policy. Now, that's fundamentally a local government function funded by the Scottish Government. We've reached a conclusion on that, and it's just an example of how we operate um, with uh, local government. Uh, but no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept the characterisation uh, that's been offered. Patrick, you had another question? Uh, yeah, thank you. On, on the capital side, um, and again, this relates to, to you saying this isn't a document for new policies. You have an existing policy commitment, uh, which was made this year, that for every year for the rest of this parliament, you will increase the proportion of the capital budget that goes on low carbon infrastructure uh, compared with high carbon. The closest I can find to any reference to that uh, is a commitment that the following guiding principles are applied to infrastructure investment, and one of them is managing the transition to a more resource-efficient, lower-carbon economy. I would have expected to see a bit more detail uh, in a financial strategy for the years ahead about how it is the government is going to meet its existing policy commitment to increase the proportion of low-carbon uh, in the capital budget for every one of the years in the rest of this parliament. Has the government done the detailed work on how that's going to be delivered, and when will you be in a position to put that into uh, your, your published uh, information about your financial plans? Uh, so, first of all, I, I agree with the, the point, actually. Uh, the, the policy continues. I affirm the policy for the avoidance of doubt. Um, I don't think this is the place. I, th I think, actually, it would have been helpful to have avoided that question, to have put it in. So that's a wee learning point for me <laughs> for future years. Um, but I don't think it's the appropriate place to publish the full infrastructure investment plan here. Uh, that, that's elsewhere. The principle continues. Uh, the workings were developed over the course of the 1819 uh, budget. I can, I can, I can certainly uh, revisit the trajectory for that. But I think it's more appropriate and pertinent going forward to do that uh, from the, for, for the next budget. So in preparation for the next budget, evidence how that direction of travel is being delivered, as well as the infrastructure investment plan, and uh, if the policy needs reaffirmed in future uh, equivalent documents, then fair enough. But I don't think this is the place for the detail of that, necessarily, but it certainly should be in a position it can be published somewhere. Well, I'll look forward to more detail in due course on that. I have a, new, a question I think, about VAT, am I right? Um, yeah, well, I was going to just touch on the, um, the forecast and stuff, wrap up that process. I think it's probably more pertinent given where we are now, if I, if I may. Um, yeah, Cabinet Secretary, we've, we've, you've kind of touched on this to some extent, but I just wanted to explore it a wee bit further. We heard from the SFC earlier on, of course, about um, forecast accuracy, and in some detail we explored the, the makeup of the forecast and why 
it was an, um, un an unreasonable or unexpected for it to be out by the amount it's out by. In fact, uh, the absolute error in their forecast is less than the absolute error in the, the OBR forecast over that, that period. Um, so it was really just to take get your view in a bit more detail on, given that this seems to be the way forecasts play out in the real world, uh, the OBR and the UK government deal with that. What do they have to enable them to deal with that that you don't have? I think just revisiting forecasts that um, um, if their position changed within five months, then will their position change again before the Scottish budget? It's a, a key point. If they have what I saw them describing earlier, more information. Um, SFC have described it to me how they, they arrive at their numbers, you know, bottom up analysis mm -hmm. of the Scottish economy approach. OBR describe it as they take a UK wide mm -hmm. approach, then they essentially do right, this is what we think of Scotland share. So they're both using different methodologies, which is a challenge in itself. But and then we have to drive our numbers from the, the, the difference in those those figures. I think having more data will, will help us mm -hmm. all. And I think that, that will lead to I think firmer forecasts and the economists will all be a bit more satisfied and comfortable in that regard, and in turn, so will we all be. Um, so I think when we have more outturned out data, we've never had it before, Scottish rate of income tax, we just haven't had the data. It's, it's, so when we get more of those real figures and we see what is actually being raised in Scotland in relation to income tax, we'll put us in a much stronger position. But that said, the closer we get to the budget, the firmer the forecast will be, and... Um, both SFC and, and, and OBR will, will look again at their um, uh, numbers um, uh, and it, it will all come out in the wash, will it, will it not, where you actually are dependent on those, those, those outturn, uh, outturn figures. Okay. Um, moving on, to talk about VAT. Um, clearly, we've talked at length about income tax this morning and VAT is coming down the track. Uh, and when you look at the process for VAT, it looks even... Um, the best way to put this, even less grounded in reality than the income tax process is, because you don't even actually have outturn data to, to look at. It's forecasts versus estimates versus um, versus whatever. What's your reflections on how that process may or may not pan out um, and the kind of problems that may cause us, given what we're learning about the income tax process? I'm, I'm sure economists and accountants across the land must be saying in relation to Scotland, independence must be easier than this, the complexity of the fiscal framework and how you use forecasts to derive numbers and then revisit them. Mm -hmm. uh, but having gently made that point, um, VAT is, a, as I discussed <coughs> at the last evidence session, I think it needs more work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that we'll have more data um, than before because of the, the size of the sample. But I think we want to make sure that the methodology is absolutely right, the starting point is right, the benchmarks are, are right. So um, we're, when we're at the point of agreeing uh, methodology, through, we, we do it through the Joint Exchequer Committee, so UK Government, Treasury and myself should sign this off. Uh, but I want to be totally satisfied as you would want to be as a committee that we're making the right decisions in that regard. Because of course it is only assignation. There's no tax lever there. It's only assignation. And surely we all want to make sure it's in Scotland's interest. So the, the issue is no further forward as I see it since the last time I attended committee a few weeks ago on Scotland Act implementation. Uh, but I want to make sure we're absolutely robust on this before we trigger its um, analysis and implementation. So I will return, as I said, I would return to committee when I have more on it. I don't, as it stands right now. Thank you. Let's push you a bit further on that, Cabinet Secretary, because of our experience we were getting on the fiscal framework and the complexity around income tax. I better, I'm conscious how I phrase this, but effectively, will you pull the plug if you think this is not going to work in terms of a benefit? for the financial settlement for Scotland in it, because you know, the potential in this area, as Ivan describes it, relying on forecasts um, and not real outturns is a real concern. That would be very bold, um, convener. Uh, I mean, we, we clearly want tax powers. I, I don't see this one as a tax power, though. It's just assignation. Um, the question I would put back to the committee is, uh, Bruce Crawford saying this question, by the way. It's not uh, something e I'll share with anybody and, else. And, and equally, what I would try and do is to get the transfer in a shape that it suits Scotland. I would simply ask 
a committee, what would you do if you were me and you felt that the methodology... I mean, we might get their methodology, but if the methodology isn't robust enough to accurately reflect what VAT has actually been accrued in Scotland, and even more importantly, if it's only assignation and Scotland takes an unnecessary financial hit just because of a point in time, what would any reasonable finance secretary for the nation of Scotland do, discuss? So I haven't come to a conclusion, convener, but I'll return to you on that. Okay. I think you can be sure this committee is going to be all over this issue. And, and I appreciate that, committee. My, my, my principle will be to try and get the successful transfer as agreed, but I think I want to be reassured that it's the right thing to do. You're going to have to reassure us as well as reassure yourself. That's going to make, 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 it may even be a harder task. Neil? Um, just want to ask you about yeah, the departure tax. It's been mentioned <coughs> briefly in the medium-term financial strategy, <coughs> and in your letter last week to the committee, you announced your intention to defer introduction of air departure tax beyond April 2019. When do you expect that uh, you will introduce air departure tax if it's been deferred beyond April 2019, and are you still committed to your policy of cutting your departure tax by 50% and abolishing it altogether? Yes, it's still the position of the Scottish Government to reduce air departure tax by 50% and abolish it when resources allow. Um, I, I have written to the committee, I have answered through a parliamentary question uh, that issue of deferral. To answer the question around when do I expect it to be switched on in Scotland, Frankly, when we have a resolution to the Highlands and Islands exemption issue, which the committee is well cited on, that uh, I will not switch on the tax in Scotland with defective devolution where um, uh, this issue is not resolved. I will not impose this tax for the first time in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. I want a like-for-like -like exemption, and I'm working constructively with the UK government to find a, a solution so that that can be... Um, uh, the case, and I continue to engage with airports, uh, airlines, other stakeholders in relation to aviation policy in Scotland, um, but it can only be resolved when we have a resolution. Thank, thanks for that answer. You've confirmed you're still committed to cutting ADT by 50% and abolishing it altogether. Um, if you are still committed to it, you're going to have to cost that uh, policy, yet it doesn't appear that the cut in ADT um, has been costed as part of the spending commitments in the medium-term financial strategy. What is the latest cost of that policy? I think last time uh, we looked at uh, the overall potential tax take at that point was about £320 million. So if you, if you, if you reduce the tax by 50%, you know, that gives you the broad figure. But I think we would cost it at the point um, where it was about to be implemented, and I'll give you those figures at the time. But in principle, we are not switching on air departure tax in Scotland, and therefore, UK government has just written to me to confirm they will not switch off air passenger duty, the UK equivalent tax, uh, so there's no negative impact to the block grant adjustment. Because I wouldn't want the UK government to um, uh, remove it from our, uh, well, uh, our finances through the block grant adjustment and then essentially we not have the option in Scotland. So um, we'll use the figure at the time that's appropriate, which will be as close to decision as possible. Well, £320 million is obviously a, a huge figure and with growth in passenger numbers that uh, could, be, could be even higher, of course. Do you not accept that with um, more cuts to local services and other services on the way and potential reductions in the funds available to the government. It is a wrong priority for this government to keep pursuing uh, tax cuts for frequent flyers, given the uh, budgetary position that you're in. The priorities of the Scottish Government are set out in this document to invest in the National Health Service, invest in education, invest in housing, invest in digital skills, um, grow the economy, um, support businesses and so on and so forth. So the key commitments published here, I'm sure Neil Bibby would welcome. In relation to your departure tax, there's clear evidence that's been published. I was asked to uh, produce it in relation to economic and environmental benefits. And there is evidence that it would grow the economy, there would be more routes in Scotland, it would retain jobs, retain routes, grow routes, and support airports such as Glasgow Airport that I'm sure Neil Bibby has an interest uh, in. Um, some airports are doing better than others. Um, they say it would make Scotland more um, attractive as a destination and also enhance their economic position and in turn it would suit the economy because it would raise um, extra revenues. So the government still supports the policy but I'm not switching it on until the Highlands and Islands issue has been resolved and devolution is delivered as it was intended to be. 
You, you mentioned digital. I think you were interested in digital, Willie. Really, so. uh, certainly, I'm Bruce. Thanks. <coughs> May, thanks. Just a couple of quick questions, if I can, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in page 60 of the document, you talk about European funding, first of all, uh, and you state there that the value of these programmes to Scotland is worth about £5 billion pounds in the current review period. When, when do you have to start to begin to introduce the impact of whether there's a reduction in commitment to this sort of level of funding from the UK when we leave the European Union? When, when do you have to start doing that work to reflect it in your financial planning going ahead? Well, different cabinet secretaries are doing that work already. Um, uh, the figure's correct. It's what we've roughly been a beneficiary of EU funding to the tune of about £5 billion over the period. It, what's the figure going forward from the Brexit negotiations? Don't know, because the UK government don't know, and they're arguing on our behalf. What guarantees has the UK government given to Scotland in that regard? None, or very little. Um, some time-limited commitments uh, to some uh, farmers is, is, is all that we've got at the moment. So we need longer-term certainty in relation to, to EU funding. We've been a beneficiary. It's helped in the infrastructure. It's helped in agricultural policy. It's helped in so many different areas. So greater certainty from the UK government would allow us to plan better in terms of what resources I had and portfolios had uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, proceed. So even if you just take, you know, farmers at the moment, it's half a billion pounds in farm payments, and they have no certainty beyond a certain time scale as to, to what that, that might look like. And, you know, we need to address this problem at source. That's the UK government not giving us the clarity. So portfolios can try and prepare right now, but we don't know what the settlement's going to be from UK government. I would like to think as a minimum, and committee should support us in this, that we should continue to get the full benefit of the resources that we got as being part of the European Union. So if the UK government insists on tearing us out of the European Union, insists on the worst deal possible, surely we deserve better than a slogan on the side of a bus. And the NHS will not be getting the £350 million pounds that were promised by uh, the UK government every week. But we should get the resources that we... That we, um, we should absolutely get the funding streams that we were beneficiaries of in the event of the UK government um, insisting that we leave the European Union. So portfolios will have to plan right now. What it inevitably means is less resource, less resource for structural programmes, less resource for skills, less resource uh, potentially for farm payments, if the UK government doesn't give us the certainty we need. And that's why we can't go further without knowing the successor arrangements uh, which are in the hands of the UK government at this point in time. Just ask you about digital. You mentioned it a few times yourself, Cabinet Secretary. We know now that the UK government is also planning to leave the digital single market, which it's estimated to be worth about 400 billion euros per year across across Europe. Uh, and you could make a, a reasonable estimate that that's worth 4 billion euros to the Scottish economy and GDP. Similar question: When when do you think you'll have to start to begin to factor in the impact of that? which, in my view, must be one of the most monumentally stupid things a government would intend to do, is to leave the digital single market. It, it, is, the, it is the height of economic recklessness, the UK government's positioning at the moment. No wonder the UK government uh, cabinets at war with each other, never mind uh, European Union uh, negotiators. But whether it's aviation agreements or digital you know, customs union, single market, the effect on the economy is profound, and we are trying to get the UK government in a better place. UK government's also um, upscaling their own civil service. So the health service is not getting the £350 million a week, but the civil service is expanding so that we can have enough, in terms of the UK, people to do the jobs of all the bureaucratic work that needs to be done. Clearly, the Scottish government will have to respond in terms of the legislation, regulations that will have to be... Um, addressed for us. So there's a point within the whole plethora of agreements and treaties and uh, regulations that will apply. Digital is just one. But, but notwithstanding that uncertainty, the Scottish Government's getting on with the £600 million Digital R100 programme to improve the infrastructure. And then we have a separate, of course, but aligned uh, strategy on skills and compliance and interconnectivity as well. Uh, okay, we, we need to get on with the rest of our business as well this morning. So can I thank the, the panel for being here this morning? I'm going to suggest that rather than suspending, we just proceed. Uh, and, um, uh, but we'll give you just a couple of minutes for those for 
who are not involved in the next session just to leave the table. I'll not bother suspending. In the interest of time. So I think John and Simon are leaving us. Okay, uh, bef so before we come to the motion seeking our approval, uh, oh, sorry. No, I'm, I'm right here. So before we come to the motion seeking our approval um, on the Scottish Fiscal Commission modification of function regulations, Again, we are joined for the session by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution. Uh, Mr Mackay is joined for this item by Aidan Gooswood, who was part of the original panel. I just wondered, was there, do you want to make, wish to make an opening statement on this, Cabinet Secretary? Not if the committee is informed of what we're approving. I don't feel the need. Well, we've obviously had the, the, the appropriate paperwork put in front of us. We had the chance to read it. Has anyone got any questions of the Cabinet Secretary? If there are no questions of the Cabinet Secretary, we'll move on to Agenda Item 4, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move um, motion S5M12320 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Scottish Fiscal Commission Modification of Functions Regulations 2018 be approved. I move. Do the members have any other further comments? No other further comments, and I put the question. The question is that a motion S5M12320 be agreed or well agreed. We are all agreed. We will publish a short report uh, to Parliament in the coming days, setting out a decision in order. I thank the Cabinet Secretary's officials for attending this morning, and I now close this public part of the meeting.